good to see you all here. I'd like to call the special joint meeting of the Board of Education and the Santa Barbara City Council to order. Will you please uh, rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Actually, we have a roll call now, if we could do that. Francisco's here, yes? Yes. Yes. Here. 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 Thank you. And also for if there's Spanish translation, where is actually do we have that available? Here I have that on the agenda. Um, headsets, if anyone needs that. Did anyone want to bring that up? Or it's right here on the agenda. Did someone I know that's Marcela Lopez, would you be available for Spanish translation? If someone needs it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, so para la transición del español, um, go to Marcelo. <laughs> My Spanish is not good. Thank you very much. Okay. Para la reunión de esta noche, I interpret, interprete disponde para trans, traducción al español. See Marcelo Lopez. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, public comment. Uh, if you have items not on the agenda, uh, we do public comment at this time. I know a number of people are here about school crossing guards. That actually would be the best time to talk about that would be during the budget, uh, after the budget presentation, which is the first major discussion item on the agenda. So items, other items not on the agenda for public comment, we're going to open up right now. And we have Kenneth Locke, and I believe others are, unless there's something else. Or Sherry Ray, actually, followed by Sherry. Go ahead. My name is Kenneth Locke. I've spoken before the city council and the school board uh, many times. And um, what I think uh, everybody should have in the, uh, interest in is having a healthy community. A healthy community is based on healthy knowledge, healthy relationships, the, um, I mentioned before the city council last time that I'm developing a school online, which I call the interdisciplinary school for the 21st century. This school is actually based on, say, healthy knowledge in relation to an interdisciplinary relationship with multiple disciplines, also in relation to the mind, body, spirit, soul integration. I'm sorry to say that uh, currently the, the school system is, is not healthy. It actually is passing along health, uh, unhealthy knowledge, which is actually... Um, providing the children with unhealthy relationships. Uh, our current economy is, is on its way out, and um, as more and more it becomes more and more apparent, we're going to realize that it was an unhealthy relationship. Actually, capitalism is, is, I'm sorry to say, not a means for a, a healthy or wealthy relationship. So as, as this goes on, I, I know it's going to be more and more apparent what I'm talking about, and, and possibly I make myself available to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Ray, be followed by Carolyn Renard. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Some of you may be familiar with me as a book author, an effective neighborhood advocate, or a local columnist, but today I speak to you as a parent of a child diagnosed with specific learning disability, which translates to dyslexia and ADD, and it took five years to finally figure it out. Five years of him struggling in our local public school special education classes to raise him from grade two level reading level to grade three while his self-confidence and self-esteem plummeted and his friends moved on. About this time last year, I went into action on his behalf, and through lots of my own research, networking with others, and challenging the school district bureaucracy, um, it was when the FICMAT report was released that I finally understood that my son's reading problems were directly attributable to a dysfunctional special education department that had done little to improve his reading skills for far too long.
It is simply unacceptable for a seventh grader to read at a third grade level, and I was determined to get him the free and appropriate education to which he is entitled. It took more hours, more meetings than I can count, culminating finally in the district allowing him to attend this specialized reading program offered by the private company known as Linda Moon Bell. He just finished his classes there last week. In nine weeks, his reading level improved from grade three level to somewhere between grade seven and eight. An almost un unbelievable improvement in such a short time, but a great example that there is help out there for different learners like him. We are overjoyed for his personal triumph and hopeful that his progress will continue as he struggles to deal with his dyslexia and math and other subjects. As, and we are appreciative that the school board saw fit to provide him with this opportunity. And at the same time, heartbroken to know that his story is not unique and that there are far too many kids in Santa Barbara who simply can't read due to undiagnosed or improperly addressed reading, learning disorders. I know because I hear from their parents all the time. I am a well-educated and determined advocate, and yet it took me five years to navigate the system to get help for my child. Just imagine how much more difficult it would be for a parent without as many resources, contacts, and ability to get appropriate help for their children. Parents don't know where to go, what to ask, or how to make their case. And I'm also thankful that my own 13-year-old boy has not fallen into the downward spiral of negativity that tempts so many of his peers who share his learning disabilities. What uh, we're being branded as what one advocate says as stupid, crazy, lazy. Poor reading skills all too frequently lead to feelings of self low self-worth, behavioral issues, dislike of schools, which leads to truancy and is surely a causal factor in restless, angry kids joining gangs. Um, I, I just think that all of our all of our children in our community exist, uh, deserve far better than what they're getting, um, and there's a bureaucracy that's not serving them. And while I was able to get help, clearly, uh, I, I know I was a unique case. I appreciate it, but more kids need it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Renard, and I believe Janet Rouse, you wanted to speak on the cannabis dispensaries because <laughs> that's on, further either on the agenda. I understand, but there's a number of people who also want to speak, too, so I don't want to make personal exceptions. But I do know that you are concerned about dispensaries. But if there are other items on the agenda, you're welcome to speak at public comment. It's a special, it's not something Is there someone here who can do that when the item comes up on the agenda? Okay. All right. You'll be after, but you're the only one. Okay. Um, and then Kate Smith will be the last public comment speaker. Thank you. Go ahead, Carolyn. Once again, I'd first like to express my extreme disappointment that this agenda, for the most part, doesn't deal with uh, the really serious issues that this, these two uh, boards should be addressing the most. And there's only one agenda item that does, and it comes up very late in the meeting, the gang task force agenda item. Uh, I, you know, as as we all know, there's a uh, a real problem with the suicides of of young Hispanic males in this community and attempted suicides. Um, I, it's beyond my understanding why why there isn't some of this meeting uh, being addressed to the issues around that important fact, uh, and, and and the fact that much of the problem with the youth in this community is directly attributable to the practices of the Santa Barbara School District. Joan Esposito of the Dyslexia Awareness and Resource Center would have liked to have been here to speak today, but she's in court with a 16-year-old who's being tried as an adult, a 16-year-old with disabilities, learning problems, which is, who is a Santa Barbara School District child, who's being tried as an adult because he stole a skateboard and hid it under his bed. Um, Ms. Esposito, um, the, his mother came to Joan after trying to get help from the schools because of his attention and learning problems for years, and she, she was trying since 2006 to get help from the school district, and she was ignored um, all that time, and, and then he ended up being arrested, and, and now he's being tried as an adult. This is a, it, it couldn't be a more classic case of, you know, the children of, this community, which this city council is responsible for, or at least, 
has concern for, I would assume, um, about what's happening to them. You know, it couldn't be more clear. The evidence couldn't be more clear. Since the FICMAT report, which I hope you are aware of, came out, things have only gotten worse, if anything. Um, Thank there you. is just no accountability. Excuse me. What? Could you please wind up? You've been over two minutes. Why is there only two minutes for public comments? That's been our city council practice for many, many years. So we're going to. Well, this isn't just a city council meeting. Well, I'm so running the meeting today. I so think this is an outrage. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I want to give you. Um, so I think you should ask the school districts for copies of the FICMAP preliminary report and final report if you haven't read them. Handing out an article to you by Sherry Raid that she put out in. in May 2009 about the FICMAP problems, um, and the FICMAP didn't even begin to address the real problems, which is corruption. Um, and um, we, uh, Jonas Basito, Sherry Ray, and myself will be contacting the council members individually to set up meetings to find out what each of you are willing to contribute to towards solving the serious problems that are going on with our school districts. Okay, thank you very much. Janet Rouse and the final public comment speaker will be Kate Smith. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. I just wanted to um, come forward and just to share for all of you here together that this morning um, there was a group of citizens and parents who were honored in front of the courthouse by Pedro Nava and we were presented with a nice resolution from the assembly and I want to thank the school districts um, for their leadership in um, bringing to you their statement um, and concern that shows their concern for the marijuana dispensaries in our community and the risk that they present to kids. And you've been hearing from us for a while, so the city council members I know are very, very familiar with what we've been talking about. But I just want to publicly thank our school board and our school district because they're doing yeoman's work every day to protect kids. And a community that's safe for kids is safe for everybody. And so I just I want to say thank you to them, and I want to share with the public um, what we were presented with today. So I don't know where, who, or how to show this for everyone to see. Great. Thank you very much, Janet. Kate Smith will be the final public speaker. Mayor Schneider, President Heron, members of the Santa Barbara City Council, and members of the Santa Barbara Board of Education. There is deep-seated and widespread corruption in Santa Barbara County. There is an education, political, industrial complex, and several elected politicians here, and several hired administrators here are implicated. There is an unholy alliance between the schools and the juvenile justice system. The school-to-prison pipeline was created here in Santa Barbara by Bill Cerrone and his cronies in collaboration with DA Tom Snedden. It was called the Truancy and Parent Accountability Program. I ran for the school board to expose school and government corruption, and so I have. Everything is included in my candidate's statement. My sequentially designed series of small claims court proceedings has created a world stage that will bring the eyes of the nation to Santa Barbara. I was so effective in speaking truth to power that the county government has initiated a slap, a strategic lawsuit against public participation, and the proceeding, Santa Barbara County Government versus Kate Smith, has been continued to June 21st, at which time I, the person, will be joined by others and so I, the person, becomes we, the people. And when we, the people, embrace an idea whose time has come, there is nothing more powerful in human form. You have a revolution on your hands. We will rise to expose school and government corruption, reform education, and restore justice and democracy in our schools and community. Do I have any more time? You have 10 seconds. You don't have to use all 10 seconds. There you go. 
power to the people. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes public comment. Thank you. Item five is the statement of purpose for the joint meeting, and I'll just start and turn it over to <laughs> Board President Ed Heron. Um, this is the semi-annual meetings between the Mayor and City Council of the City of Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara School District we've put together a number of years ago, and I personally have always found it to be enlightening and a good way to keep the dialogue moving between these two public bodies. I think uh, generally our constituents tend to look at both the city and the schools as as government in, in general and sometimes don't know the distinctions between the two and, and that's good to highlight those connections when they can be made and, and uh, where the different elected bodies have are in charge of certain parts of their own money and budget and so forth so we'll be talking about that but really I just appreciate the opportunity to get to know uh, my fellow colleagues I guess on the school board and, and it's a great opportunity for us to have a public forum like this so um, thank you for being here and Mr. Heron if you'd like to add anything uh, just a couple of things. Uh, everything you said is. Yeah, you want there to turn that on. There you go. Everything Thanks. I agree with everything. Um, for ten years, this, these two bodies have been meeting together, and I think we all understand. We all have mutual interests in our youth, and the things that happen in the city and happen in the schools. And it's never more important than it is today because of the budgetary issues. Uh, we both have our own priorities and and have to make decisions, um, and so money becomes an issue. And when you have tight budgets on both sides, we've cut, I think, Brian, $20 million in the last two years, and the city has probably done about the same. Uh, we just, this year, we've cut $9 million, and you have the same issues coming up before you right now. Um, it becomes a matter of how do you spend your money. And the public doesn't really care how we spend our money as long when, when children are involved. They want their children taken care of. And between, the, between us at this table, we have to make sure they're taken care of. And so the issue is we're going to take care of them, it's just a matter of how we're going to pay for it. And so I appreciate the attendance today. I appreciate getting to know each and every one of you here on the City Council and the, and the past year, the board, too, a year and a half. So uh, we look forward to the meeting. Great. Thank you. Items number um, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 have written reports. It's sort of like a consent calendar item. We don't, we're not voting on anything, but if there's anyone who'd like to bring anything up on these items before we move on to our first presentation. Any questions or comments from those items? I have, I have one question. Mr. Heron, yeah. I noticed in there that La Colina typically has three sports fields, but only two are in use because of gophers. Or, or You're talking about the joint use agreement? The joint use agreement. Item I'm seven? just curious. Uh, Mr. Het Young has the problem taking care of itself. Do we now have three fields at La Colina? He's out of the room? Oh. I'm just curious. It, I, Mr. Sarvis? We will get you that information. We have Sarah Hanna here who probably knows quite a bit about it. I'm not a district employee, but um, it is my understanding that, yes, they are addressing that problem. And over spring break, they were using a new way to rid gophers out of the gopher holes, and that was done every, every day over spring break. And I understand that it is reducing. They're filling in the holes, and we're doing a good job of that. There's Dave right there. Thank you. Het Young, it's about La Colina and gophers. I'm satisfied with that answer. Okay. Well, then, you're off the hook. There we go. Any other questions or comments? Yes, uh, Dr. Noel. Yes. Uh, uh, the National Guard Armory Report, number nine. Number nine, yeah. Uh, I drove by there the other night. The lights were on, and I saw volleyball nets. And I think someone told me that uh, that our schools are, are using that, that... Uh, can we, is that correct? We could have a comment on the Ms. Ms. Rapp. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Nancy Rapp, Parks and Recreation Director. And actually, it is the Santa Barbara Volleyball Club that has a rental situation with the National Guard Armory, and they are actually conducting youth volleyball programs there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And I think Mr. Williams had a question on item 10. Not so much a qu uh, question, but more just a, a desire to have people look at it closely because it really, in the changes of the solid waste rates and in the move by the city and the school district to increase uh, uh, food scrap recycling, composting, lies a lot of potential to save a whole lot of money, um, uh, which will help our kids and help 
balance our budgets. And, and uh, so if any member of the public hasn't seen that, uh, they really should take a look at it. And, of course, if any of the school administrators uh, haven't, they should take a look at it because I think the potential w was to save uh, $250,000 a year. Thank you. That item was about the school district city collaboration on food scraps and recycling. And I'll just add, as um, I was, as a council member, part of the school district recycling committee and seeing the huge jump from, I think, about 24% diversion to over 50% now district-wide in just five years, or right? Um, it's tremendous, a big savings. And um, some school harding um, on my Neck of the Woods is up to 92% diversion because of their uh, cafeteria and, and zero waste cafeteria. It's fantastic. So keep it up. That's very exciting. Um, any other comments on those items? Okay. I'm going to move on to the, the biggie number. Do we want to do both 11 and 12 together? This is both the school district and then the city. Have that together and then open it up for comments since it's all combined. Can we do that? So item number 11, which is the presentation of oh no i'm sorry it's all it is all on one yeah. so item 11 protect presentation on city and school districts budget planning for the upcoming fiscal year mr samario thank you madam mayor mr president members of the board and council uh, so i'm going to spend a few minutes t talking about our city's budget by the way i'm bob samario the interim finance director for the city and I know for the council members, this will be a bit of a redundant presentation. They just saw this past, this past Tuesday, at least most of these slides. So I apologize to them, but uh, hopefully it's informative for the rest of you. And so I'm going to go through about, you know, 30 slides or so, so and, and just give you a sense of what we're dealing with as we uh, wrestle with about a $9 million problem in our general fund. So I'm going to see if I can just load this up real quick. So just real quickly, the outline, I'm going to just show you a few slides on the citywide totals. Uh, we'll spend most of our time talking about the general fund where we've had our problems with our tax revenues going down, and we'll look at the revenues, expenditures, and the scope of the problem we're facing next year and how we're dealing with that, and then just what I consider to be some outstanding challenges for, for the next few years, actually. So this is a presentation we have in our budget document. It's the sources and uses of funds. And you can see it's by category of fund type. And a lot of people don't realize, but we have um, a lot more going on than what just goes on in our general fund, where we account for our traditional services, such as police, fire, library, and the like. We actually have a number of other operations. And if you can see that uh, beyond the general fund, which is about a $100 million budget, we have what are called special revenue funds. Um, those are funds where we account for revenues that are restricted for whatever purpose. Uh, we have grant funds, for example, we get each year that are restricted for a purpose. Our redevelopment agency is a special revenue fund, and those, of course, are restricted dollars. And then we have our enterprise fund operations, which account for our water, wastewater, um, salted waste, and those kinds of activities, big operations. They really function like a business and very capital intensive. And then you can see we also have another category, which is the internal service funds, which is just those operations that provide services to other departments. But what I really wanted to show you was the totals here. If you go down toward the bottom, you'll see the line, a row called operating budget. And you'll see that the total operating budget for the city next year, as we're proposing, is almost a quarter of a billion dollars. So it's a big, big operation. And it's interesting because when people hear that, they're surprised because they see Santa Barbara as this charming little town, but it actually plays a lot bigger than that. We have quite a bit of scope of operations. So you can see that sort of a breakdown of that budget, how it breaks down between the various fund categories. The general fund is about 43%. Uh, our enterprise funds, almost 40%, and then our special revenue funds, as I mentioned, including grants and the RDA, uh, 20%. So looking at the general fund, uh, this is our recommended budget in a nutshell. This is really the story that we're, we've we been dealing with. Back in November, December, January time frame, we were looking at um, next year and making projections, and we had identified at that time about an $8.9 million projected budget cap, and caused really by three things, primary things. Historic declines in our revenues, and we'll see, take a look at that in a moment. The fact that our, our wage and benefit costs are going up. They go up every year based on existing contracts. And then this year we implemented some one-time measures. When we had, we've adopted the current year budget, we had about an $11 million problem we had to deal with, and some of those solutions were one-time. And, of course, anytime you use one-time measures, they're not available the next year. You've got to deal with them. Our balancing strategy includes, so far, about $5.2 million 
in departmental adjustments. These are primarily cuts to, to programs and services, a lot of staff eliminations, mostly vacant, but there are some filled positions. We also identified one million in new revenue sources, and then still we're not fully balanced. This is one of the few times, at least the only time I can remember, where we submitted a recommended budget that's not fully balanced. We're short $2.6 million, and that gap we're hoping and expecting that would be closed through labor concessions that we're currently in discussions with all labor groups. So, and that's our expectation that with the with those labor concessions, we'd be able to at least close the, the two point six million dollar gap. If, if possible, we'd like to be able to restore some of the positions that are that are slated for elimination. So, quickly looking where the money comes from in our general fund, our revenues, you can see a total of about ninety nine point eight million dollars. Most of our revenues come from taxes. No surprise. Um, property taxes are, are our biggest at twenty two point eight million dollars. Sales taxes. Used to be our biggest, but because the recent declines have really gone down, are now in second position at $16.7 million. We receive bed taxes, our transient occupancy taxes at 11.6, and then utility users taxes at $7 million. And by the way, that's just half of what we get in UUT. The other half we account for in our streets programs where it helps to fund our streets programs and maintenance, maintenance et cetera. Um, we do have what we call interfund charges. These are charges to other operations in the in the city, mostly for what we call overhead ser services that are provided by finance, city administrator, and the like. We charge out to enterprise funds. One of the things we also want to point out and like to point out is that our service charges. These are fees and charges we for various services we provide, whether it's recreation, um, community development, library. We don't really generate much by way of fees, less than 10 percent. So even if we were to raise fees. Uh, 10%, we would only get an additional $1 million, uh, far short of what we need to close the gap. It's really the taxes that make up the number, and, and of course, we're very susceptible to economic swings in that category of revenue. Where the money goes, by department, you can see that public safety, police and fire represent about 52% of our budget, almost $54 million. Very typical for a general fund in each city. The operating departments, excluding public safety, represent about $34 million, or 33%. And then the administrative departments, that's finance, administrative services, city attorney and the like, um, about 10%. And then we have this other category that um, I know Henry Snyder, or Mayor Snyder, always likes to joke about, our non-departmental department. It's where we account for our debt service, our capital program, and of course our community promotions where we spend almost uh, over $1.8 million uh, for one of the biggest recipients is the Conference and Visitors Bureau uh, who receive about $1.4 million. Expenditures by category, because this is always interesting. Uh, the salaries and benefits, 78% of our overall budget. So um, as you can imagine, when we're looking at cuts, we really don't have a lot of options when, when uh, revenues go down other than looking at labor to reduce our overall cost structure. We receive costs charged to the general fund from in the, those internal service funds that I mentioned. That's for like for motor, pools, motor pool services, custodial services, and the like. That's 8% of our budget. And supplies and services, just 8%, so a real small portion of our overall costs. So looking at defining the problem, just to give you some perspective, over the last 14 years, our sales tax revenues, you can see since 97 all the way up to 2001, when we had the events of 9-11, we were averaging 6.1% growth per year, which is pretty amazing. Of course, everybody remembers the, the, the economy really rolling and going strong in the late 90s. We did see a 4.1% decline in 2002. That's when, again, 9-11 hit. But even since then, we've had pretty good growth at 3.3%. But then you can see what happened last year. And the recession really began in September of 2008, which is for us our fiscal year 2009. And that year, we saw a decline of 10.6%. For, for this current year, we're expecting another 3% decline. And what that really means to us is that we've lost essentially 10 or 11 years of, of growth in just a two-year period. And same with our bed taxes. Uh, you can see a 9% growth from 97 to 2001. Um, and then we did see a decline, but also then after that, 6.2% growth. But then more recently, 6.9% in 2009, and a 5.6% decline in this current year that we're projecting. So here we lost five years of growth. But really, to bring it more current, you can see the revenues over the last two years, starting with the adopted budget 2009 and comparing it all the way through the current recommended budget for next year, you could see that we are now, we would have lost almost $10 million in just two years. So that's almost 10% of our budget. In sales taxes, you could see that we've lost 21% of our sales taxes in just those two years. 
and 16% in our bed taxes. So significant declines in just those two revenue sources. On the expenditure side, you can see the change from 2009 adopted, where we had total expenditures of almost $109 million. And now, based on next year's recommended budget, we've actually made reductions of about $6.6 .6 million, but we're still not done because, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we, we are still short $2.6 million in closing the budget gap, and that's going to have to come from expenditure reductions. So we'll, that number will grow. So when you look at this a chart, it kind of reflects that same pattern that you can see the trend line from ex for our expenditures back starting in 2004 all the way to 2009 when the recession hit. Since then, we've made reductions in our budget, as I just showed in the previous slide, of $6.7 million. What's interesting is if we had not had a recession and made no, no cuts, our budget to tomorrow, next year would be at about $114 million, so just the trend line. So while we made $6.7 million in reductions or expenditures, really what we avoided or what we actually had to cut to get to where we're at today was almost $12 million, and that's what we've seen the last couple of years. We'll ultimately have cut about $12 million, uh, more than that when we're, we're actually done because, again, we're still need, we still need $2.6 million more in cuts. So just a big, it's a big number we've had to deal with in the last couple of years. Our balancing strategy, you can see the originally adopted or identified budget gap of 8.9. We did identify, as I mentioned earlier, about a million dollars of new measures, and I won't get into them because they're not that important other than to note that they are new revenue sources. We did reduce funding to our outside organizations, community, community promotions and the like, by $367,000. And then, of course, our department came up with $5.2 million in adjustments, mostly expenditure cuts of 4.2, but some revenues, some new revenues they identified, which was great. But we're still not done. As I said, we got $2.6 million left to go. And this just shows you quickly the individual departments and what adjustments they've had to make in order to arrive at the $5.2 million and the number of positions that have been impacted. In the general fund, you'll see in the right, right is 36.1, but really, because other funds are impacted, we will have 41 less positions next year as a result of the, of the uh, economic recession. So next year, we're recommending 1,004 positions citywide. In 2009, at the peak of 1,085, so we've gone down about 80 positions in just two years, most of those in our general fund. And you can see now we're back to where we were back in 1999. Some outstanding challenges quickly. As I mentioned earlier, our revenues, the, the nature of them is that they're volatile. We're, they're based on tourism. And so when the economy is strong, so are our revenues. But when the flip happens, our revenues take a big dive. This is obviously an unusual recession. And, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, some of you may have attended the recent uh, USCSB economic um, forecast project where they're talking about, you know, this next year may be okay, but the following years there's still a lot of fundamentals that aren't resolved that could result in, you know, the double-dip recession, if you will. But certainly nobody's expecting that we're going to have a quick recovery like we typically do in, in a recession. It's going to be a moderate re recovery. So, you know, we're not expecting to be able to grow out of this problem for a few few years at least. The state impacts, you all know that the state is facing an unprecedented $20 billion deficit through next year, um, actually at this June 30, 2011. We've already endured cities and counties, three RAF shifts, and, um, you know, a couple years ago, three years ago, there was a Proposition 1A that was approved by the, by the voters, but, um, you know, and it was supposed to be protecting our revenues. There were, there were some loopholes, apparently, that the state was able to find. And um, there is a new initiative right now being sponsored by the league and others that would apparently or ostensibly close that all those loopholes. But uh, I'm not I'm not really confident about that. The state's pretty creative, and so I think that when they're in desperate times, they're going to find other loopholes, and we'll just probably end up in this vicious cycle where we have one measure we approve, then they come back with something else. And I just think that the story is going to be that way until the state really solves their budget problems in, in a real meaningful way. All of you have heard of the PERS impacts, the losses they had in 2009, the stock losses. They lost about um, almost 40% of their assets. They went from $350 billion to about $260 billion in just one year. And the way our rates are set, they're two years in arrears, so we won't start seeing those impacts until fiscal year 2012. So that's where we're going to at least, at least see a 5%, 10% increase. But the board is currently considering a couple items. One, that lowering the, the assumed rate of return of seven and three quarters in light of recent uh, declines. I think it's a little short-sighted because these pensions are funded over a 30-year period, not over a two-year period. 
Um, but that's something they're considering. And they're also considering changing the mortality tables that they that they use to, when they assume life expectancy. And the, a recent study found that people are living longer, and so that could have an impact. So if they make changes in those two areas, we're going to be able, really seeing 20, 30, 40 percent increases in our rates in the next several years. And I mentioned the nature of our cost structure is 78 percent of our general fund costs are for labor. Very typical, but that just puts a lot of burden on us because we have fewer options, few options in making cuts other than staff. So quickly, we have nine remaining work sessions to look over the budget. I won't go over these, but between now and June 16th, and t a couple of three hours each, and we'll be presenting each of the department's budget during these um, budgets work sessions. Uh, we've already had one this past Thursday, actually yesterday, so nine more, and then we expect to adopt the budget late June. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions from the board or council on this item? Mr. Heron? I'm curious. A year ago when we met, uh, your property tax revenue, I believe, was assumed to be 2% increase. Uh, number one, was it? And number two, what is your presumption this year? Um, Mr. President, I think last year we did make that assumption, but in the reality this year what we're going to see is probably either flat or slightly down. Uh, next year we're expecting about a 1% decline. Okay. Questions? Okay, I think we want to move to Mr. Smith. If you want to do your presentation, then we'll open that for public comment. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Mayor, Mr. Board President, members of the Council and Board. Uh, my presentation differs a little bit from Bob's in the sense that mine's not, pre uh, mine's not prospective, it's retrospective. Um, and I apologize to the Board for conjuring up all the pain that we lived with over the last year and a half, but there's no way really to describe where we are and where we're going without doing that. Um, last July, we dealt with uh, the outcome of the state's budget or their failure to put together an 18-month budget. And at that point in time, we adopted a budget based on assumptions that we thought would come to fruition. We um, adhered to our constitutional obligation to adopt a budget by June 30th, went away on vacation and came back that what the state actually adopted didn't look anything like what we thought should be adopted. Primarily, the biggest impact to us was the fact that um, the assumptions were tweaked and we were hit with a one-time cut of roughly $253 per student that was never contemplated in any of our budgetary scenarios. That $253 st uh, per student equaled about $3.4 million, with about 1.1 of it allocated to the elementary district and about 2.3 allocated to the secondary district. Um, for the council's benefit, school districts, for the most part, I mean, dependent on size, have to carry a minimum reserve for economic uncertainties. For our districts, we have to carry 3% of our total um, expenditures in the general fund. So anytime you're presented with a one-time hit like this, out of nowhere, it forces you to scramble. And what we had to do is, in, within a couple of months, basically put together a plan on how we were going to address this above and beyond the budgetary cuts that we made in the prior year. So I'm going to walk you basically through how we did that, and then I'll talk about what happened after that. Um, since these were one time in nature, you can see we used a, a variety of sweeps, um, flexibility transfers, one-time cuts to get where we needed to get. Um, the state did bestow some flexibility authority on us so we could move money from the restricted side of the ledger to the unrestricted side. You can see the first item in item A generated about $262,000 in the elementary and about $1,700,000 in the secondary district. We basically reduced our routine restricted maintenance account in the secondary district for what we thought was going to be one year only. 
um, and the routine restricted maintenance account is basically a covenant we make with the state whenever we receive state school facilities dollars off state school facilities bonds. We have to pledge for 20 years from that date that we will allocate 3% of our total expenditures toward the maintenance of those facilities. So by basically suspending that, which once again we thought was going to be on a one-time basis, we are able to generate $523,000. We had an issue with Cottage Hospital where we found that some fees were not paid. We worked out a settlement agreement. That was 62431 uh, and you can see there's a 70-30% split between the secondary and elementary district. It forced us to analyze our self-insurance funds. We saw that in our self-insurance fund for workers' compensation, where we were previously self-insured uh, with a, um, another JPA, we had a residual excess fund balance that we could move over. We basically were able to identify, since the elementary district was moving into basic aid status, that we would have excess property taxes um, that would be accruing to us that could be used to pay down this obligation as well. Um, one of the things that we weren't aware of relative to the state budget is that we had a recalculation of the K-3 class size reduction apportionment because what was included in the budget was that it would be based on the 0708 fiscal year baseline that netted us another $83,967. We recognized excess property taxes due to reduction in charter school and lieu taxes. Um, we're required under state revenue limit or under the state charter school block grant entitlement laws to move X amount of property taxes from our unrestricted general fund over to our three charter schools until such time that they re reach their statutory cap. We were able to recoup our Meals for Needy add-on from the secondary district that had not been paid across districts, and uh, we made that budgetary transfer to move. Since we had more money generated in one district, we had to move it over to the other district to meet the actual allocation in terms of how much was going to be recouped by the state. So that's how we started. And that's, that's how we started the fiscal year, and that's after the budget. So it was not a very auspicious beginning. I think after this occurred, the board um, was very anxious not to wait until the last minute during this fiscal year to adopt their expenditure reductions going into 10-11. They adopted a very aggressive timeline relative to looking at cuts, adopting cuts, and hopefully minimizing the uncertainty of creating our fiscal year 2010-2011 budget. So as we move forward, we had a timeline where basically we would have our first interim, and we're required to do two interim reports that are submitted to the board for a, a certification that can either be positive, qualified, or negative. Positive meaning that we can meet our current year obligations and subsequent two year obligations. Qualified meaning that we may not meet our current year and subsequent two year obligations. And negative meaning that we certainly cannot meet our current year and subsequent two year fiscal obligations. We've been positive the last two and a half years now, I believe. But the first thing we do is first interim report, which basically is a snapshot as of October 31st. It has to be presented to the board prior to December 15th. We have to, one, identify whether we can meet that, but also it helps us, since we have to put together multi-year projections, really hone in on what we think the size of the deficit. And my board's used to hear me saying, structural deficit, which I define as the ongoing imbalance between unrestricted expenditures and revenues. And since our deficits in terms of our unrestricted our reserve has to be made up of unrestricted dollars, we're always focusing on the unrestricted side of the ledger. So at that point in time, we thought it was going to be about $5 million. Remember, we're in December here. We waited till the January's, uh, the governor's January proposal, and at that point in time, based on the news we got there, we revised that to $6 million. Before that, the board adopted a time frame where they wanted the cuts actually adopted in February. Well, we do a first and second reading with the idea there was that if we were going to make program reductions, we could minimize the, the amount of over-noticing we do with certificated staff. We're under a statutory obligation to notice our certificated staff by March 15th if there's going to be a reduction in force. 
If we don't do that, we're basically stuck with those folks for an entire year. So usually most districts wait till later, April or May, but the problem that has for you is that you wait on the May revise and you've basically noticed everybody and you end up bringing a lot of people back because you've erred on the side of caution. We were a little bit more methodical and aggressive here in terms of trying to identify what the number would be, basically put together the program reductions, look at the implications of reduction in force and have that all done by March 1st. And I'll show you how we did that. I think it's this one. Yeah, I got the summary on this one. I don't know why I had the narrative on the other one. Um, so this is our third phase of our fiscal solvency plan. You know, um, I thought once we wrote the first phase, it was going to be done. But, you know, we keep adding phases. We're up to phase three now. So as you recall, we had a reduction in routine restricted maintenance account for our one-time reduction plan, and we thought that was going to be one-time in nature. Well, it was not one-time in nature. Given the size of the structural deficit, we decided that we would have to reduce our routine restricted maintenance account in both districts from 3% to 2%, and that's uh, the flexibility is under the state's budget allows us to do that. That did um, result in a reduction in force of about six FTEs. Um, I'm not even going to comment on the crossing guard issue. I think everybody's pretty well versed there. Um, it pretty much speaks for itself. We shifted expense. May I, may I comment on that? Sure. It, it really doesn't speak for itself. All it says is we've eliminated the funding. We didn't say we eliminated crossing guards. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. We'll get to that. Um, we shifted the expense of transporting students from program improvement schools to non-program improvements schools by using Title I. Basically, that's just a shift of that expense, which is permissible under the law, from the unrestricted side of the ledger to the restricted side. We looked at things like reducing telephone expenses at elementary schools where we're implementing VoIP, uh, eliminating two-way two communication devices where there was redundancy because we had radios that could be used rather than cell phones. Um, we bid the contract for waste hauling services in the unincorporated areas of the Santa Barbara Secondary District. Um, and I think we have some additional good news in that respect. Um, since the elementary district was moving into basic aid status, for those inner district students that are attending our charter schools that come from revenue limit districts, we get 70% of their statutory based revenue limit, so we we're able to acknowledge that revenue. Earlier in the year, the board applied for waivers through the State Office of Public School Construction for unused site fees that were being imp imposed on us. Um, we got news that both of those were granted. Interestingly enough is once you move into basic aid status, those fees go away altogether. Um, and that's really a function of how the state actually deducts those fees from you. It's off the state apportionment. Well, if you're not receiving a state apportionment for revenue limit, there's no mechanism for them to deduct it. Um, um, streamlined accounts payable processes to reduce late fee penalties. We've moved to a more streamlined um, auditing process. We're fiscally accountable, meaning that we can issue our own payroll warrants and AP warrants. And uh, we had a fairly stringent, um, actually 100% audit process that was imposed on us by the county education office. With working with them, we can do more of a random sampling, which will basically allow us to expedite those kind of things and, and basically prevent us from having late fees. Probably the biggest reduction in force number here and the biggest dollar value here is even though we did not have to negotiate this because it was contained within the existing contractual provisions, we basically moved in the secondary district class size uh, staffing ratios up near, not to the maximum, but near the maximum under the contract. You can see it. two of the high schools will be 34 to 1 in most classes with some exceptions. And in San Marcos, it'll be 32 to 1 because of the block schedule and moving to 32 to 1 in the junior high schools. Uh, and that was for a reduction of 38.72 FDEs. We reduced psychologists by three. We eliminated the Homeschool Santa Barbara program, which was an ind independent study program, which really did not make sense to run in the elementary district because the whole idea of running independent study when it was originally envisioned was to generate ADA through the revenue limit. The elementary district is now a basic aid school district, so there's no fiscal incentive to operate it. 
it took, made us take a hard look at our summer school programs since summer schools are funded by uh, the unrestricted general fund through what we call the supplemental hourly program and we looked at the not only the cost effectiveness but the program effectiveness of it and it just did not seem to make sense to keep moving forward with that although I believe there will be some um, programs operated through categoricals at specific elementary schools. Um, we made other staffing reductions in the alternative ed programs. Um, we eliminated some of the youth service specialist counselors. Uh, we eliminated our entire community day school program. We did not replace a principal at Santa Barbara Community Academy and chose instead to replace that position with a head teacher. Uh, last year we had a partial reduction in some of the administrative staffing at the district office in the area of welfare and attendance. We went the rest of the distance this year. We implemented administrative furloughs, 2.13 non-duty days resulting in a 1% reduction in pay for management employees. I love the 21 to be determined. I determined that already, but I can't remember how I filled that hole. But <laughs> <laughs> We reduced the athletic trainers' times at the three comprehensive high schools. They were all eight-hour positions by two hours each. We eliminated support staff at the district office, actually in the personnel department by one. And we consolidated some of our health assistance between the Santa Barbara Community Academy and the Lacumba Junior High to one shared position since they basically are co-located on one campus. Sorry, board, but that's how we got there. A little over $6 million. Um, and as I've told the board before, I'm not sure we're done. Right now, our future steps are looking at what the May revise holds for us. Um, we're hoping this is it, but as I've told the board, I can't promise this is going to be it. We'll know more on May 14th, my birthday, so I'm hoping I get a good present rather than a lump of coal. So, so I'd be happy to answer any questions relative to this issue. Um, Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ouch is right. Uh, any questions from any questions on the board from the council or board members? Ms. Self. Um, I read years ago that a, one school was hiring a compliance officer to make sure that they were compliant with all the rules and regulations. Uh, does each school have? its own compliance officers has that been consolidated no we actually compliance issues are really coordinated through two individuals at the district office um, compliance in terms of adherence with categorical program guidelines and things of that nature through our director of curriculum and compliance and then if you're talking about compliance issues like office of civil rights and things of that nature that's through our director of student services at the district office mr. white Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, what is the community or was the community day school? Um, it, it's interesting. Community day schools arose out of kind of a response to community schools that were operated by the county education offices through the state of California. There was basically this perception by the Department of Finance that somehow community schools, which had high revenue limits, were making money off serving that student population, which in that case is somebody who's either probation referred, um, excessively truant, or expelled. Um, a few years ago, I guess, man, it's all running together, I guess about nine or ten years ago, the legislature gave school districts the ability to run community day schools as an alternative to sending those students to a county community school, but it's basically operating the same kind of program for those students, and there was some incentive funding tied to do that. Mr. Williams? So I'm familiar with all the um, bad things the legislature did last year to, to hurt school funding, but they did do one thing that wa was, in theory, should have made things a little bit better, and I was curious how that affected things, which was a suspension of a number of categorical funds that you would not have been able to use as far as your, part of your general fund base um, how did that change um, you, the, this at all, it, or is going it looking into perspectively? Ten, going into 1011, it did not have much of an impact. I, 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 should, I should rephrase that. We basically used all those arrows out of our quiver in the prior year. So 
one of the things you might be speaking to is that the state put their categoricals or restrictive programs in three different tiers, a tier one that could not be touched and was not deficited, a tier two which was deficited by about 20 percent but could not be touched, and when I say touched, I mean you didn't have the flexibility to move it around, and then a tier three which basically was still deficited by almost 20 percent, but they gave us the latitude to move those dollars to the unrestricted side of the ledger. We made a conscious decision after doing some analysis, and we did this going into um, I guess it was 910. Um, we did an analysis in terms of how many people were tied to those, and about 70 percent of personnel, those, those dollars were consumed by personnel. So we took 30 percent and moved that to the unrestricted side of the ledger. So we did that. The flexibility is good until 13, 14. But one of the problems with flexibility is that unless it's sustained beyond 13, 14, you have to basically turn the clock back and it becomes a de facto cut. The same thing with K3 class size reduction. They gave us flexibility there, but interestingly enough, only through 12, 13, it does not align up with the 13, 14 day. And we basically raised class size a little bit from 20 to 25 in K3 the year before, and that was another flexibility measure that wasn't previously we didn't previously have access to. So if I'm understanding the situation correctly, if w the one of the things that would help the most is to make those changes permanent so that you could continue to use that 30% 30, 30 as part of your general funds and or if there's any tier one that should be tier two or tier two that should be tier three and if so, I'd love to see your list of those. Yeah, there, there's a conversation about that. I mean, Tier 3, I mean, the way you got most of those state categorical programs is because basically you had certain legislatures, slate, legislators that basically they became their pet program. So, right. so there's, you know, a lot of resistance to basically sustaining the flexibility beyond that from especially the Assembly Democrats. But if you don't do that, it's a de facto cut because basically where you got that flexibility to offset, you know, those increased costs on the unrestricted side, you got to turn the clock back and that's revenue that you've lost. So I think there will be immense pressure from the school community once those deadlines approach. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to before I turn it to public comment, since a number of them are about school crossing guard issues, I wonder if Mr. Armstrong, if you could give sort of a historical context of the funding, where it came from, moved over to the school district, the whole story before we get to this. Yes, um, last fiscal year, or this fiscal year, to be in the fiscal year, we, um, as a part of our budget reductions, uh, recommended that we um, uh, delete the funding for crossing guards, and that was based on the recommendations from the police department in terms of their priorities and how they prioritized. Um, and they moved some funding around that, that help, assisted them. And basically, by moving the funding around, it allowed us to um, not cut one police officer position. Um, our plan was to work with the school district to um, work with volunteers or with school staff to train them so that we could then continue that service. Um, after discussions with the school district, the school district agreed on a one-year basis only to, um, to provide funding for that program. And so we have continued to provide that service with the funding that's been provided by the school district. We also have a, a much smaller agreement with the Hope School District to provide uh, crossing guards, I believe, at two schools there. So at this point, um, we have not included any funding for crossing guards in next year's budget. Uh, um, and so if, if the school doesn't provide the funding, there's the potential to go away. Of course, obviously, that's still to be cited by the council and the school board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to move it to public comment. If you could come to the podium, I'm sorry there's not a timer where you can see it. I'm using the second hand on the clock up there. That's how I'm knowing when two minutes are up. And if, um, when you hear your name, if you're next on the list, if you could come up and line up behind the podium, that will help move things along a little more efficiently. So we're going to start with Brent Milholland and then followed by Cricket Wood. Good afternoon, board members and council members. Um, I'm Brent Milholland. I'm the principal at Monroe Elementary School on the Mesa. Um, 
We have uh, on our site a towering 40-year-old redwood tree with a plaque to commemorate a boy who was hit and killed just down the street at the intersection of Flora Vista, Cliff Drive, and Mesa Lane that all come together. Um, he was on his way to school at the time. The incident prompted uh, the installation of a stoplight at that intersection. At the same intersection last spring, a mother and her daughter crossing the street were struck by a truck but survived. Last fall, there was a six-car pileup at the same intersection, which is confusing and takes extra care for drivers to uh, maneuver. There are actually two different signals within three car lengths um, of, each, uh, of each other controlling the intersection of the three streets coming together. So it's very confusing. I can't tell you how many other incidents have been averted by having our crossing guard there to help children make it safely across that intersection. We have a second crossing guard. Um, he's right across the street from Monroe School at Flora Vista and Redwood, uh, I mean Red Rose Way, because of a second confusing intersection. We often have motorcycle policemen who park at this residential intersection because there are so many traffic violations that take place that threaten the children's safety. I truly do fear for the safety of our students crossing these intersections twice a day if crossing guards are removed from service. Their presence is invaluable and should never be eliminated. We never want to have to plant another commemorative redwood tree at Monroe or any other school in town. So I appreciate your consideration for uh, maintaining the crossing guard program throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you. Cricket Wood will be followed by Damian Barnett. Um, hello, uh, Council and Board of Education. My name is Cricket Wood. I'm a parent of students at Monroe Elementary School. I'm also the PTA president. I have a petition that's been signed by parents and teachers um, at Monroe and McKinley, who also does not have crossing guards, in support of finding a way to maintain funding for crossing guards that I'll leave here with you today. Um, I wanted to say that um, my family bikes to school almost every day, and last year when my kids were in kindergarten um, pushing our bikes across the crosswalk, um, there were several times where my son was almost hit by a car trying to go around another car, making, trying to make a left-hand turn. Thankfully, the crossing guard in a bright orange vest and with a big stop sign was out there going, hey, stop, catching the person's attention. Um, and crossing guards are, I think, an essential component. Um, and I encourage you to stop and not just think about numbers, but think about our city's um, philosophy and plan as we think of ourselves as sustainable Santa Barbara and one of the green cities of California, that we should be encouraging our next generation, our children, to be walking and biking to school. If our funding doesn't support that view, that tells our children that that's not important to us. And their safety in using alternative transportation is not important to us. Um, it's not a huge dollar amount. I understand times are tight and we have to find ways to do it. But we also have to have a long-range goal and long-range vision for what's important for our society. And I encourage you to consider that as you consider budget cuts. Thank you. And keep our crossing guards, please. Thanks. Damian Barnett will be followed by Virginia Clark. Good afternoon. Uh, Damian Barnett, principal of uh, Washington Elementary School, also on the Mesa. Uh, we are in. I have to explain the pink hair. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was hoping not to distract you <laughs> the topic. I won't take it against your two minutes. Uh, I was uh, desperately trying to raise money to save crossing guards. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a long-standing bet with my students for our fundraising goal, and then it's been three years running. They haven't made the goal. This year, they made the goal, and uh, the bet was that if they made the goal, I'd dye my hair school red. So, congratulations! Here it is. Okay. So, thanks to the students for pulling that off. Uh, we are in unprecedented fiscal times, as both of the financial managers have said, and I understand that the tough um, choices that we all have to make as organizations. Um, that said, I feel that our job as leaders, first and foremost, is to ensure the safety of the people that count us. And funding crossing guard positions fulfills this mission, in my opinion. Crossing guards help literally thousands of children uh, be safe each and every day. 
Um, and as an elementary school leader, I can also say that these people help our students learn how to navigate the streets in a safe and uh, in a safe way. Because of the high number of uh, the city children served, I urge you to see the cost of crossing guards as actually quite reasonable, given uh, the services rendered to the number of people each and every day. And I believe, as Mr. Mahone pointed out, the true cost of not having crossing guards could be a child injured or worse. Uh, we know that the budget decisions are difficult, and we have to choose between many uh, different worthy programs and initiatives. However, I urge the city to consider funding crossing guard positions in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Clark, be followed by Eva Inbar. Thank you very much. My name is Virginia Clark. I'm a parent of an Adams sixth grader and a former parent, or a, a parent who used to go to Adam, excuse me, to Harding Elementary. So I know both crossing guard situations, both at Adams and at Harding. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the 505 students we have at Adams Elementary, the parents, the teachers, and the administrators. Um, in one of the wealthiest communities, I was speaking with someone back east this morning and telling him what I was coming to do this afternoon, and he was shocked. He said, in one of the wealthiest communities in this country, $112,000 can't be found. Um, I agree. I had heard at one point that one of the rumors was that the sixth graders would be suggested as volunteers. I wonder how many of you would volunteer your sixth grader or your 12-year-old to cross other students at Las Positas, which is essentially a freeway, certainly in the morning and the afternoon. I would like to know the number of or the dollar amount that comes in with the speeding tickets. There are probably four to six, I asked the crossing guard this morning, probably four to six speeding tickets at least per month, and that's just in the morning time. People go 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. I know I'm sometimes scared about crossing that street. One of the things, as one of the earlier speakers, the PTA president from Monroe said, I would encourage you to speak about the numbers and to think about the numbers. Certainly, I, I applaud her suggestion about Santa Barbara as a green community, and not encouraging our students to walk or to bike is really um, not in their best interest and not in the best interest of this community. But also the numbers, $112,000, if someone were to be injured or to be killed, you would have to add a lot of zeros to that number. So I would encourage you to think about that. And we also have a petition that inside of about 25 minutes garnered 113 signatures. Thank you. Eva Inbar, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Be, hold on, be followed by Michael, Michael Brill. You. Good afternoon. Crossing guards, you may be aware by now, are unlike any other item on your cut list. They really are a vital public safety service for children. And believe me, they are not a job for volunteers. I've volunteered myself during all my years in the PTA, and I've coordinated other volunteers. And uh, volunteers are great, but this is not a job for volunteers. It's a public safety for, uh, service that the city should fund. They're also an excellent value for what they do. They really are all our heroes, and they don't get paid very much. So uh, um, I think they, they are excellent. Uh, cities around the country fund their crossing guards. Generally, it's the city that do that, and they fund them out of their traffic safety funds where the uh, traffic fines go. Um, this is also the rule in Santa Barbara County. Most cities do fund the crossing guards. Among them are Carpinteria, uh, Lompoc, and Guadalupe. Uh, none of these cities is as rich as Santa Barbara, and they do fund their crossing guards. Santa Maria funds half of their crossing guards. Um, so uh, if they can do it, I have to wonder about Santa Barbara. Um, uh, I urge you to use the money that you have, the traffic safety funds where they used to come from, again, for its intended purpose, which is crossing guards. This is not general fund money. It's traffic safety fund money. So this is, should be the top priority for that money, the safety of children. There couldn't be a more important thing than that. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Vail will be followed by Beatrice Flores. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, and, and Board Members, uh, my name is Michael Vale. I'm principal at Cleveland School. Uh, I would have done the same thing with my hair if I'd had enough to do it with. Um, each of our city schools represent or have uh, unique traffic 
problems um, and dangers. Cleveland School has is surrounded by thoroughfares. We have uh, APS that connects Montecito to the downtown area and Salinas, which connects the east side to to Montecito and the and the the freeway. It's an alternate route to the freeway. Um, we over the years have had numbers of accidents and all of those thoroughfares are around our city. We had one we have one famous telephone pole that's been hit by the same person twice. Um, while we laugh when we see that, uh, these represent tr real dangers to, to our children. What we have in common though with all of our cities our schools is the fact that we have hundreds of, of children coming to school each day. Um, we have a wonderful person and when we think about budget cuts, and I um, applaud you for your efforts in trying to come up with, with answers to this fiscal, fiscal crisis. But when we look at this uh, crisis in human terms, there is, there is Ms. Hazel. Ms. Hazel is at the corner of Clifton and Salinas every morning. She is our crossing guard. She protects children as they cross uh, Salinas. There are hundreds of cars going there, through that area every morning. There are hundreds of children. Uh, crossing diagonally across that traffic. Ms. Hazel helps to keep them safe every single morning. She's done it for almost 30 years now. Um, we have picked up, we have another location just up the street at the corner of San Inez and Clifton that also represents a shortcut that, that people can take off of Eucalyptus Hill. Um, and we have we, we put our own crossing guard there now. These are difficult problems that you face. I know that you take our children's safety as, a, as the primary of importance to you. I thank you for the work that you're doing. I hope you'll find crossing guards for us. We opened this school year, the current school year, with no crossing guards. I'm a horrible crossing guard. We hope that we can have not volunteers, but, but people who are thoroughly trained to keep our children safe. And I thank you for your efforts to make that happen. Thank you. Beatrice Flores will be followed by Lisa Fell. Hello, my name is Beatrice Flores. I'm, I am the parent of three kids at Monroe and one at La Colina. $112,000 overall is not a lot of money. It should be thought of as insurance to save a life. If you take away the funding for crossing cards, it's not if a child will be killed or if a child will get hurt. Somebody will get hurt and somebody will be killed especially at Las Pesitas, especially at Cliff and Flora Vista. People are trying to get to work. They're busy, they're hurrying. During the fall months, the, the sun sets right or arises right at where the drivers are looking. We've had a couple of near misses this year. Overall, it's not a lot of money. It's a, think of it as insurance to save a life, a child's life. If you need more convincing, why don't you do 112,000 divided by the number of students in our district? It's negligible. It would, it's absolutely nothing when you look at it that way. Do not eliminate funding. Eliminate something else. Because children need to be safe, they need to be cared for, and they need to be alive. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Fell will be followed by Carolyn Renard. Hello, members of the council and board. I am Lisa Fell, the PTO president of Washington School, and I'm representing our parents and children. 275 Washington parents have signed our petition in agreement, and 150 students signed their own petition, pleading that they remain safe crossing the streets and the crossing guards continue next year in funded positions. We strongly urge the city council and the police department to fully fund our school crossing guards next year. If you count on volunteers to staff these crossing guard positions, there's a much higher potential that they will not show up for their shift every time if they're not getting paid. So they will definitely, there will definitely be days when there's no one there. It is not appropriate for positions where children's safety is concerned to be filled by volunteers. It is impossible for teachers and staff to fill these positions because they have to be with their students in the classrooms and the office. I know that the money used for our crossing guards will have to come out of something else, but what else is more important than the safety of our children? If just one child gets hit by a car and either seriously Ill injured or killed, is it worth the money saved? Is it worth taking that risk? 
We all know that cell phone use while driving has become a significant concern these days. We all see it. Even though people say that they don't talk on the phone while, or text while driving, we still see people doing it all the time. Just ask the crossing guards. So there has never been a more important time than now to have these crossing guards with their stop signs that are more easily seen than little children. And they need to be there every time. They need to be funded. You say that you will take care of our children with the budget you are given, but how can our children be taken care of while they're crossing the street without funding to make sure someone is there to stop the cars? When deciding which programs and positions to fund with your smaller pool of money this year, please put children's safety at the top of the list and keep our crossing guards. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Renard will be followed by Kate. Smith. Okay, just said Kate. I'm just reading it. Oh, Kate Smith. Yes. Sorry. That's all right. ADD forgot my last name. Go ahead. I'd like to return to the Santa Barbara School District's financial report. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not clear why Mr. Smith didn't mention the $4 million, I believe, in ARA funds that the Santa Barbara School District received last year, which is on top of the state, the money they received from the state. Um, I also, I wanted to return to number 11 on Mr. Smith's list, uh, getting rid of three school psychologists because of the recommendations by the FICMAT. And uh, I wanted to let you know, when I speak of, of corruption in the schools, I don't do so lightly. Uh, I emailed the FICMAT, uh, the person who was in charge of the investigation and report at FICMAT, and I said, well, uh, could you please tell me on, uh, the reason I emailed him is because um, Santa Barbara School District is using this recommendation to retaliate against and get rid of a school psychologist who used to be a special education administrator who was demoted after he started speaking out about the violations of the students' rights and made complaints, filed complaints, which were successful with the California Department of Education. Uh, he was demoted after that. Now he's gotten a layoff notice. He's demoted to a school psychologist, and they're saying, oh, the FICMAT um, recommended we get rid of school psychologists, so we've got to get rid of you, and they're also using a... a in my opinion, misapplying a law that is supposed to apply to teachers to say he has no seniority, even though he's been there for probably about at least three years. Um, so, so I asked FICMAT to provide me with the exact data they used to make that recommendation. Um, they told me, they gave me a, a vague answer about, well, they used the CBEDS recommendations, and I, I did some research on my own, and CBEDS is not a system of recommendations. Um, so I said, well, I need the exact data you used, and they refused to respond. I then sent a fax to their executive director saying that, look, I need this information. They're using it to retaliate against this man, um, and uh, he refused to respond also. I then sent a, another email that I cc'd to Jack O'Connell and, and other people, and I got a response finally from them saying, we don't have to provide any rationale for our report. It stands on its own. Okay, thank you very much. I don't make corruption charges lightly here. This is disgusting. Thank you. Kate Smith, and the final speaker will be Tisha Levy. Thank you. Point of information. Point of information? Go ahead. Okay, that's not on my time. Uh, is there any one of you capable of understanding the convoluted and complex funding school model of California State. Part of your time, Kate. No, oh, no, yes. not if it's a point of information. Well, then, can we start over because I, what I said... And start right now. You have two minutes. Okay. None of you can explain the convoluted and complex California State funding model, although there was a conference about it and the need to reform it on November 11th of last year. None of you knows the definition of categoricals, revenue limit, seabeds, etc. The schools have lost sight of the educational mission. You talk money, we're talking about our children. Not one of the cuts were to administrators. There is a propensity for self-aggrandizement. There is no self-scrutiny. And there is a sense of invulnerable status. Taxpayer paid lawyers and cronies, otherwise known as consultants, FICMAT or California School Services, receive $1,500 per day, even now, today. 
to obfuscate the situation. Money is not the problem. Management is. The school-to-prison pipeline is the disturbing pattern and practice of incarcerating the low socioeconomic sector, youth, the most vulnerable, instead of educating them. It makes huge amount of money and causes death and destruction. Two years ago, at this joint meeting in this room, September 12, 2008, we talked about community day schools and the jail schools. I stated that there is systematic and systemic violations of state and federal laws, and I stated the corruption banner, denial of education and civil rights under color of law. Fifteen seconds. The city council approved the CalCrit grant. 800,000 were misappropriated from the Office of Emergency Services. Nobody knows what GRIP stands for. There is no accountability. The gang task force is a cabal, and the overwhelming claims by the victims of the EPIC, the school-to-prison pipeline, will Thank you. come to the small claims court for exposure. The final speaker will be Tisha Levy. Hello, my name is Tisha Levy and thank you for your time today. I am a parent of two boys who attend Monroe Elementary um, and more importantly I actually live right on Flora Vista um, so I am fortunate enough that I live on the same side of the school that they attend so they can actually walk without ever having to cross the street at all. I am one of the few fortunate parents that don't have to have their child cross the street. But going to work every morning at 8 o'clock, I see the chaos that would happen if there was not our wonderful crossing guards there. So before you guys make this decision, I would like to send an invitation to you all to come on the corner of Flora Vista, hang out with me from 8 to 8.30, and actually witness what these crossing guards do instead of just imagining what it would be like without them. Come out there and see. I'll provide coffee. Yeah, everybody's welcome. Hang out. You can actually see what they're doing. So when you make this decision and you're hearing all these people make these amazing statements, come out and see yourself, you know, either on the cliff, of, cliff in Flora Vista, which is insane. And I actually applaud these crossing guards because they're taking their lives in their hands when they're out there trying to help our kids cross the street safely. So before you make the decision, come out there and actually watch what they do. Between 8 and 8.20, the magnitude of buses, bicycles, walking, cars of people either going to and from school or to and from work is really, really unbelievable in what happens in a 20-minute barrage. So once again, call me. I'll be out there with the coffee and donuts. And you can actually see what our amazing crossing guards do. So take this in consideration before you make a decision, see what they do, then see what it would be like to eliminate them when you actually, actually see what they actually accomplish in that 20-minute time span. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you all. For that concludes the public comment on this item. And just to remind us, this is we're not making any decisions today, but certainly have this for when we do on the budget. Um, any comments or questions up here? Mr. Williams. Well, I, I really appreciate the public comment, and I was definitely um, uh, affected by it. Uh, I... Um, I think these are really tough times, and I, I for one, uh, respect the tough job of our um, school board members and administrators in dealing with it. And I, I, it's always tough when decisions get made in a distant place, Sacramento, um, that hurt our schools, and then you guys have to make tough decisions about it, uh, and usually most of the angst gets directed at, at, at you all, um, and, and maybe not at the people who made the de decisions to cut that funding in the first place. Um, I do think that um, school crossing guards, and I think that's one of the issues uh, that we should probably address, is a public safety expense. I do think that this, the city has uh, a shared responsibility with the school district to address it. Um, I'm not sure that we have mo the money to deal with it, but I think that, uh, at least for myself, um, uh, if there is money that becomes available, to me it would be the highest priority of what is not in our currently in our budget to address. Um, and so I'll throw out some of the ideas that have come up thus far that would make that budget situation better. One is way, the you know um, uh, you know the obvious thing is that the caveat with that budget is that it takes us enacting all of the cuts that 
staff has recommended. Mm. Secondly, it requires employee groups to agree to wage concessions that add up to enough um, money to close that additional 2.7 million gap. Um, third, to also address things like um, crossing guards, it would necessitate us to do one of several things. Um, uh, some ideas that have come up before, um, uh, you know, is the single-use bag tax. Uh, another one has been to consolidate, um, and I have suggested that we um, lease out the city attorney's office and, and move that either back here or into city hall. Um, uh, Mr. Francisco, myself, and uh, Ms. Self on the finance committee have discussed um, another uh, possible measure of requiring the solid waste fund to pay back the uh, general fund um, for monies that were general fund expenditures that were put into the uh, solid waste fund. Of course, these are all have their own ramifications. If the solid waste fund pays back the general fund, well, that might mean that someday your trash fees go up more. Um, uh, it might not happen this year, it might not happen next year, but it might happen at some point. And so I guess what, what, I, what would be useful to me beyond, you know, let, it's good to know all the people who want us to uh, save uh, the crossing guard program, but I think it's also important for folks to argue about how we're going to come up with that money. Um, and I've put out a couple of those ideas, and I hope uh, people continue to do that. It, but as I said, I'm, I'm committed that this would be my top priority uh, in a vote on the city council for restoration of, of funding. Other, yes, Ms. Self? Uh, I'm not sure I understood you, Mr. Williams, but um, my understanding is that the budget can, that we saw does not consider wage concessions that have not yet been granted. So if we get wage... I'm going to let Mr. Armstrong um, address that instead of going back and forth over here. Okay. Yeah, as Mr. Samario said, our budget is still out of balance by $2.6 million, and our our goal is is that when working with our labor associations, we'll be able to meet those savings and hopefully exceed it and then allow the council some flexibility to look at um, some of the cuts that we've included in the proposed budget. Okay. Comments, questions up here? Ms. Parker. I want to first say thank you uh, to both uh, of our budget directors um, for the presentations. Um, it was really helpful to see the city's picture. Um, we've actually been making budget cuts since 2002, 2003. Um, so we're kind of numb to it in a way at this point, I would say. It hasn't been a two-year process. It's been more like seven years. Because before the recession hit, we were in declining enrollment, which means fewer students, fewer, uh, fewer dollars. Um, so it's been a very long and difficult um, decade, essentially, for the Santa Barbara School Districts. Um, I want to specifically address school crossing guards, and I want to start with a big thank you, because when the school board first heard that the crossing guard program had been cut by the city, it was summertime, and there weren't parents around to uh, protest or to raise their concerns. Um, school board members had the exact same concerns that many of our parents have brought up in terms of putting in a, a volunteer program in place, which was what had been suggested. Um, and so the first thing we did was um, beg Mr. Smith to find $112,000, even though we had just cut millions, um, so that we could, on an emergency basis, request the city council to approve a memorandum to keep running the program for another year while we figured out what to do next. And um, I just want to thank our staff and the city staff because they did work that out, um, and uh, it made a huge difference over the course of this year. Um, my own next priority uh, over the winter was next steps. Um, obviously, we knew we were getting hit again by um, huge budget cuts, as the city was going to be. And um, I started doing the research, and what I found was that, as Ms. Inbar pointed out, um, across the state of California, many cities do pay for school crossing guard programs. And the reason that they pay for school crossing guard programs as opposed to school districts is because when school districts pay, it comes from our general fund. It comes from the money that we have to pay for teachers. Um, whereas the state has put in 
a vehicle code um, called the, that leads to something called the Traffic Safety Fund, as Ms. Inbar addressed. So everything that has to do with um, moving code violations, when you get a ticket because you run a red light at Las Positas Road, that goes into the Traffic Safety Fund, and it's very restricted. And I want to thank um, Mr. Samario for forwarding. Uh, you forwarded part of the code to me, um, which says... It can be used exclusively for official traffic control devices, the maintenance thereof, equipment and supplies for traffic law enforcement and traffic accident prevention, a few other things. The fund shall not be used to pay the compensation of traffic or other police officers. The fund may be used to pay the compensation of school crossing guards who are not regular full-time members of the police department of the city. Um, I had not heard any of this before, so when I first saw this, I was like, oh, great, maybe there's the solution within the city. And what I found doing the research and looking at your past budgets is that is exactly how you had been paying for it. Um, and so uh, I, again, appreciate the input from Mr. Armstrong and from Mr. Samario, because I did ask at that point, well, you weren't paying for a police officer with it, which is what we had been under the misapprehension was happening. But as Mr. Armstrong was saying, they were juggling funds um, so that they would shift, the city decided to shift more maintenance costs to the traffic safety fund um, in order to free up more general fund money. Um, these were maintenance costs that had previously been um, paid for by the general fund. Um, and Mr. Samari did send me a list of things. It's uh, vehicle rental replacement, maintenance costs on the motorcycle unit, um, some uniforms, um, towing fees and storage, um, it's, it's a whole range of things because things is what it has to be. Um, my hope, and uh, this will be my suggestion, Mr. Williams, is that when you have the discussion, and typically what I, what I saw in looking back at your presentation specifically about the police department was that there wasn't a specific discussion going on about the traffic safety fund. It was about your general fund. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect. Um, but I would like to see um, the community having a conversation about would it make more sense to make cuts in things um, than it would be in people? And maybe that's the direction that a discussion could go. I know that there may end up being other areas that we can look at um, in terms of funding school crossing guards. Um, I have spent so much time on this. I know that our board thinks this is uh, really critical, and none of us wants to see this go away. So, Thank you, Ms. Parker. Any other comments? I guess I'll just uh, end this that for me personally, it's not whether or not to fund crossing guards. It's how we're going to do it and whether it's working with the school district and trying to find matching funds or because we're both hurting desperately. But I guess that's where I'm headed. And, and for us, I guess, for the council, it's going to be our police department budget where those questions are going to come up, which is in May in the evening session. So I'm sure they'll have comment about that. Mr. Heron? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Parker mentioned the MOU that was established between ourselves and the uh, City Council. I'll just read one portion of it. Because both parties agree that it is important for a means to be found to continue the program, it is agreed that during the term hereof, District and City will engage in discussions to identify a funding and program model for the Crossing Guard program to be maintained in subsequent years. I guess I would ask our staff, make sure that happens. With the caveat, it better happen. Okay. We have our work cut out for us in the next few weeks. Okay. I'm going to close this item. Um, I have a question for Dr. Sarvis, Mr. Armstrong. We have typically 55 minutes technically left for this meeting. We have uh, a presentation about becoming a basic aid school district, the South Coast Gang Task Force, and medical marijuana dispensaries. So um, we can talk quickly perhaps, but I want to make sure we have enough time to go through each of these. We can keep going. And up to my call, I know people might have places to go at four. I would recommend that we forge ahead. Okay. So. Ensure that our staff goes very, very quickly. Okay. All right. So I do want to make sure we have enough time for things, but just want to put that out there. So we are up to item number 12, presentation on the fiscal implications of becoming a basic aid school district. And is that Mr. Smith again? Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you probably noticed from, how do I get out of here, from the prior presentation that when we went through the cuts, most of them were concentrated, if not all of them, in the secondary district. Th there's a reason for that. The secondary district remains in revenue limit status, and revenue limit 
means that you're dependent on the state for funding. The elementary district's moving into basic aid status, but for you to understand basic aid, you need to understand revenue limit. There's about a thousand school districts in the state of California, and only about 70 of them are basic aid. Everybody else is revenue limit. And what revenue limit means is that for each type of district, and when I say type, I mean elementary, unified, or high school district, they each have a unique revenue limit an amount of general purpose dollars per student, or we, our nomenclature, ADA, average daily attendance. Although there might be some similarities across the state, for the most part, they're all unique. And they're based on historical factors that existed in time when the revenue limit was created through the legislature. That's the first thing you need to know about revenue limit. The second thing you need to know about revenue limit is revenue limit is composed or comprised of a combination of state aid and property taxes, okay? So in that combination of state aid and property taxes, there's an inverse relationship. So if property taxes increase, state aid is reduced. The reason it's called a limit is you never get any more than the limit. So if you have $5,000 per student and you have X number of students in the district, it's whatever that huge bucket is, um, is the entitlement. So if your property taxes go up on a macro level, that just means state aid is going to be reduced. So that is what we call the revenue limit entitlement. And a lot of times we use the analogy of a bucket. So if you could envision a bucket, that the top of the bucket is the revenue limit entitlement, and let's say you had some rocks and some sand, and let's say you keep pouring in rocks, which are property taxes, until such time that the sand is displaced, and the rocks are pouring over the top, that is when you become basic aid because your property taxes have exceed your revenue limit entitlement. And the reason that's critical is because once your rocks overflow the tip of the bucket, you get to keep all those rocks. Whether they're one rock or a thousand rocks or 10,000 or a million rocks, you get to keep all those rocks with some exceptions, which basically the legislature has done to us just in the last couple of years. So how do you become a basic aid district? Well, really, it used to be thought you could only become a, a basic aid district by one of three ways. The first way is that basically um, your district has a very low statutory revenue limit. Remember I said all revenue limits are unique, and the statutory revenue limit was that snapshot rev revenue limit that was given to you by the state as it's been adjusted by COLA and stuff over time. But if you have a real low statutory revenue limit, that means the top of your bucket is a lot shorter than a lot of other districts. So if your property taxes grow modestly, you're going to get to the revenue limit entitlement quicker. Doesn't mean you're rich, just means that your property taxes are exceeding your revenue limit entitlement, but probably at a very low level. The second characteristic is there's a couple of variables that drive you in. State aid, which is basically more kids, drives you away from revenue limit. Property tax growth takes you toward revenue limit. If the state deficits, and I'll get to that in a minute, that takes you toward basic aid. So if you have a combination of declining enrollment and sustained growth in, in uh, property tax values, then you're going to get there quicker. A third one, and we have a neighbor to the north in San Luis Obispo County is a perfect example. You have some kind of phenomenon in your district boundaries that creates unusually high wealth. Diablo Canyon, a nuclear power plant in the back of San Luis Coastal, that, ge that generates enough AV that basically drives them way into basic aid status. The property tax values are so great there that basically it's irrelevant what happens with their local uh, residential or commercial because the actual assessed valuation on Diablo Canyon is so much that it basically drives them right in. Okay, so those are the three conventional ways you get there. But that's not how we got there in the elementary district. If you surveyed the literature three or four years ago, the way we got to basic aid status in the elementary doesn't show up in any of the literature. We were deficited into basic aid status. So right now, we're at an 18.335% deficit on our revenue limit. So we're getting 81 cents, and four, 81, a little over 81 cents per dollar from the state. So we're getting about $1,700 on average less than we were two years ago. And what that effectively means, if you go back to the analogy, our bucket was here, it's been shrunk to here, and our property taxes have been growing modestly. So basically, we're in basic aid status, but we have like our toe in the bathtub. We're only that deep. So we're on the cusp. 
which is basically what it means, is that we're, even though we're basic aid, we're operating at a lower revenue per pupil than, would, than we would have been if we remained in revenue limit before the cuts. So that's, you know, I keep stressing to my board, basic aid's not a panacea, and you probably read that, you know, one of the reasons we want to get into basic aid status is because if you're no longer dependent on state aid, then you're somewhat insulated from the cuts you get in state aid. But remember, that was the strategy, but we're still operating in a much lower revenue base in totality than we were before. So when the board made a conscious decision to send inner districts back to their districts of residence in the elementary, that was the underlying cause. So the year we go into basic aid status, the legislature gets this great idea that, hey, you know, basic aid districts, and remember there was about 73 years ago, now there's about between 130 and 150 with the other balance of them all being deficited into basic aid status, is, hey, you know, basic aid districts are getting away with murder. You know, they should be sharing the pain. So they implemented this thing called the fair share reduction. And the fair share reduction basically says is, hey, we want you to calculate what your revenue limit entitlement is. Then we're going to take 5.81% of that, and we'll take the absolute dollar value. And since you don't, have, you don't have any revenue that we give you that's general purpose, but we still give you categoricals, we're going we're gonna to ding you against those state categoricals. We just heard over the weekend, now we're hearing, is the way they're going to implement that, is that they're going to take the greater of your excess property taxes or the 5.81%. Well, we're only a couple hundred thousand dollars into <laughs> basic aid in the elementary, so take it. Because, you know, in the elementary, the 5.81 fully actualized would be about 1.3 or $1.5 million. But the problem, th the thing that's problematic about it is, is that our excess property taxes will have to grow to exceed that 1.5 before we get to keep it. So that was the only thing that, um, uh, I see you over there, Brian. <laughs> so <laughs> now you made me lose my train of thought. I was on a roll. <laughs> so in any event, um, when you see the cuts that, that were incurred in the secondary district is because for, to some reason the elementary district's much more insulated, not completely, but there are factors that affect basic aid districts. Now that we're no longer dependent on state aid, anything that basically has an adverse effect on property taxes, whether it's, I talked about charter school in lieu of property tax transfers, and Dante's gonna talk about redevelopment, its impact on basic aid status, all those things have fiscal implications for basic aid districts. And so that's a nice segue. Dante um, Gamusio from Public Economics is here. He's going to talk about the relationship of redevelopment relative to basic aid districts. Which one is it? Uh, Impact redevelopment. Sure. There it is. Mayor Schneider, President Terran, members of the Council of the Board, my name is Dante Gamusio. I'm CEO of Public Economics, and I love your city. I love to come here. I love to visit. It's a great place, and uh, I just wish I could move my business here. But I can't, alas. I'll just have to content myself with making short visits. Um, let's see if I'm pushing the right button. And I'm not. I want to just use my mouse. Oh, got it. Thank you. All right. We have less time than I would like. Um, the objectives of this PowerPoint presentation, I understand you all have a hard copy, so um, I will leave it to you. As a former economics professor, I will give you an assignment to review your hard copy so that you can satisfy all of these objectives. Uh, for the Santa Barbara City Schools, one objective is to introduce RDA concepts and definitions to you because redevelopment is not your business, it's the city's. Uh, and also to identify the district's entitlements to payments from RDAs. For the City Council, it's to introduce education financing concepts and definitions, including basic aid, to you. And Eric has already accomplished a great deal of that. Uh, we also want to identify, and this is the main focus of the presentation, how redevelopment affects the basic aid status of schools, and then what uh, issues do both the city and the school district, uh, school districts have in dealing with this issue. All right, very quickly for the board. 
Uh, whoops, how do I get... I hit escape. Got it. The redevelopment agency is a separate municipal corporation. It is not the city. Uh, its legislative body is the city council, uh, but it's a separate municipal corporation. The County Board of Supervisors also has a redevelopment agency, and they have uh, the, the Isla Vista redevelopment project, which is within the boundaries of uh, uh, the high school district, certainly. Uh, the powers of RDAs are typically limited to what we call redevelopment project areas, or projects. There are exceptions. So, school district members, school, school district board, RDA refers to the redevelopment agency. Project refers to the project area within which the RDA exercises its powers. Main reasons for redevelopment projects. Eliminate blight. Expand the supply of low and moderate income housing. Some people call it low and mod housing. Others call it LMI housing. I'm a big acronym man, so I call it LMI housing. And expand employment opportunities. The RDAs have many powers. They are, for the most part, set forth in the redevelopment plan. It's not the general plan. It's a separate legal document. Among many things, the redevelopment plan, uh, well, we'll talk about the plan in a minute. Uh, the RDA uses what's called tax increment financing. And that's the main focus of the school districts right now because of the impact of tax increment financing on basic aid status. Uh, when RDAs use tax increment financing, they don't raise anyone's taxes. Tax rate does not go up. The only uh, tax increment revenue that the RDA receives is from a growth in assessed value within the boundaries of the RDA project area. Uh, the RDA has to set aside 20% of its TI, of its tax increment, for the housing. The RDA, among many things, can negotiate agreements to fund public improvements, perhaps a corporate yard involving the district. The public improvement does not have to be owned by the city. It can be owned by any entity. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to, I know there are at least four people here are going to have to leave at four, and so I want to make sure okay. we get through. I, I think people are pretty aware of what redevelopment agencies are. We have the documents in front of you. I just see 20 oh. slides, and you're on slide oh. four. Okay, so. very good. Well, so. I talk fast also. But, okay. And under Thank certain you. circumstances, the RDA can make pass-through payments to uh, affected taxing entities, for example, per AB 1290. Now, this slide talks about the redevelopment plan. Uh, the second sub-bullet refers to financial and other limits. There are uh, limits in the plan to incur new RDA debt in Santa Barbara for the Central City Project. Uh, it's, it was fiscal year 3-4. The RDA cannot incur any new debt because it's past that date. There's a time limit for other various other actions. There's a time limit on how long the RDA can receive tax increment. And there's a dollar cap, a TI cap, if you will, uh, on the tax amount of tax increment the RDA may receive. Now, the RDA can amend the redevelopment plan. I've got to step in here. Yes. The city council is totally aware of all this. Yes. Uh, in detail. Yes. And so, and so, but the board isn't. Well, this may oh. not be the time to educate the okay, board. Okay, very good. In my I was, opinion. Uh, very good. We'll move on then. Uh, there is a distinction between a major amendment and a minor amendment to the redevelopment plan, however, that may be uh, useful here shortly. Um, all right. How does tax increment financing work? Well, let's go to a slide. Within the Central City Redevelopment Project area, currently uh, about 27% of every tax increment dollar that would otherwise be received by the county general fund is diverted to the RDA. Uh, the second biggest player is Santa Barbara Elementary School District, 23.6% uh, of every TI dollar. Uh, then the high school district, 17.2%. Then the city also loses uh, property tax growth to the RDA, uh, and then there are other uh, players there. Uh, it is not correct to assume that um, the schools lose a million or two dollars a year, as you'll see in a minute. Tax increment financing. This is a graph uh, that roughly approximates the tax increment financing that the RDA has received uh, since fiscal year 3-4, uh, I think was their first tax increment year. Uh, $454 million is shown there uh, as the projected total amount. Um, the RDA's tax increment cap is $431 million, but about $23 million of that is outside the cap. It's old money that was received back in the day before the TI cap was imposed. Uh, the RDA's time limit on receiving tax increment is 54 years. Uh, we are very close to see. We are in year 40, what? 
49, no, well, we're, we're close to the end, but um, you'll notice that the TI is stopping before the end, and that's because the, uh, uh, the uh, TI cap is, uh, is, is, is bite, biting us, if you will, uh, in advance of the TI time limit. Now, the RDA currently doesn't have enough debt to justify being allocated all the TI generated within the project. We think that's, gonna, that, that's going to become an issue for the RDA in 2016-17. PEI projects that with 4% growth, the RDA will hit its TI cap in 1819, uh, and after that, the, the RDA can't receive any tax increment. Uh, even though the RDA technically has until 2526 to receive uh, tax increment, but obviously not if those other two constraints are uh, are binding. All right. Tax increment from AV growth in the project. It's allocated to the RDA. Part of it is passed through to affected taxing entities in some cases, and. Uh, uh, in other cases, if there are no pass-through payments, then all the tax increment that the RDA receives is available for use by the RDA. Now, AB 1290 payments are a um, statutory pass-through requirement that applies in certain circumstances. Uh, there is some disagreement about what those circumstances are. Um, here uh, is an overview of the pass-through entitlements of the high school districts, see the HSD, and the elementary districts, see the ESD. Uh, currently, the elementary district only has the city's Santa Barbara Central City Project. is the only RDA project within the elementary district's boundaries. Uh, the Central City plus Old Town and Goleta plus Isla Vista in the county project are within the boundaries of the high school district. You'll note, by the way, that uh, the high school district is entitled to 2% uh, payments and AB 1290 payments from the same project, Isla Vista. Um, we are noting that uh, we believe that an argument could be made that uh, the high school district is also entitled to AB 1290 payments from the Central City Project uh, pursuant to AB 1342. Uh, evidently, the city doesn't agree, uh, but that's not uh, the primary focus of our presentation. All right, we've talked about education financing. We'll just note that uh, the current deficit revenue limit for the elementary district is $4,969 per ADA. And for the high school district, which educates high school kids in high school facilities, high school districts always have higher revenue limits than elementary districts do, uh, their revenue limit is 5967 after the deficit. All right, uh, Eric's already talked about revenue limits and basic aid districts. Um, the elementary district uh, is achieving basic aid status for the first time this year. We think the high school district may squeak in the door uh, next year, if not next year, then the year after. Now, the tax increment that's diverted from the, the districts to the redevelopment agency is backfilled by the state if the district's a revenue limit district. So if, if you will, the RDA is taking some of the rocks out of the bucket, uh, then the state pours more sand in or... Is it the other way around? Uh, whatever the, the district may be losing to the RDA, when, if it's a revenue limit district, the state is supposed to backfill. Now, obviously, with an 18% deficit factor, the state ain't backfilling uh, as it should. Uh, on the other hand, for a basic aid district, any uh, rocks that have spilled over and are being taken by the RDA are being taken by the RDA. They're not being backfilled by anyone. All right. Um, so for revenue limit districts, uh, losing tax growth to RDAs does not reduce their operating revenues in principle, in theory, as long as the state backfills. But it may delay or prevent attainment of eventual basic aid status. And we'll see in a moment that that has been the case. For basic aid districts, losing tax increment to the RDA does reduce their operating revenues. It may even cause the loss of their basic aid status. All right. From fiscal year 73 to 74 uh, until the RDA reaches its cap, uh, we estimate that the total foregone TI from the elementary and high school districts to the RDA combined uh, to will total about $181 million. And that will be about $202 million if you include ERAF, because ERAF is also being diverted, uh, when there was ERAF, uh, to the RDA. Now, through the current year, the total lost revenue from the schools to the RDA is $102 million, $123 million if you include ERAF. And over the last uh, 10, 11 years, 
it's 66 million. And uh, most recently, uh, last year, uh, it was uh, uh, 4.6 million uh, uh, to 9.3 million with ERAF. That's a combined figure for the two districts. Um, so uh, there's a lot of money here moving from the school districts to the RDA for good purposes, of course. Um, but in the absence of having lost, having given up that revenue growth, the elementary district, even before its revenue limit was deficited, would have achieved basic aid status at least four years ago in fiscal year 5-6. And the revenues that the elementary district has had diverted to the RDA since then total about $6 million, which is about $356 per student. So when the elementary district is looking for funding and, how oh my gosh, how are we going to do this, it would be nice if they had another $356 per student, but they don't have it because the RDA has it. Uh, the high school district is far enough away, has been far enough away from basic aid status that losing dollars to the RDA really hasn't affected the timing of anything for them. All right, so with 4% growth and looking forward, um, we think the RDA is going to start to run out of debt in 16-17. And when they do, let's say that the RDA generates uh, $20 million of tax increment, but they don't have enough debt to justify getting all of it, so maybe they'll only get 17 of the 20, and the other 3 million will have to go back. We'll have to revert back to the city, county, and special districts. Um, we're guessing here that in 1617, that would be about uh, um, 0.7 million to 1.2 million to the high school and elementary district. In 1718, it's going to be a bigger reversion because the RDA will have even less debt, and there'll be a bigger potential tax increment pot. So a larger portion of that pot will go back to the taxing entities. Uh, we think the elementary and high school district, four to seven million. And then in 1819, that's sort of it. Uh, the, the RDA will cap out, and um, there'll be quite a bit of reversion. Still not all the tax increment in that year, but most of it will still revert, 10 to $11 million. The elementary and high school districts are looking forward to that day. Yes, reversion is a good thing. Uh, we love you, RDA. You've done wonderful things with our city. You've been, you've been a successful agency. There's lots of RDAs that are terrible. Uh, you, you have no idea where the tax, what, how the tax increment was used. No, here we see this lovely, beautiful city that Dante loves to come to and wishes he could move to. Thank you in part to the RDA. Thank you, RDA. You did it with our money, but that's fine. But now we're looking forward to the wind-up, okay? Um, and then after 1819, uh, it, all of this growth in the tax base that you've caused reverts. And then the school districts get, you know, 12 you, million bucks a year. If you could wind up, please, that okay. would be great. And, of course, if the state takes $6.8 million of our RDA money this year, then we're all messed up. Then anyway. we're all That's messed up, but bucket, I think so. you've got a good chance of winning that lawsuit like you won Genest. Okay. Now, so the districts want to, up, this please. is the last slide, the districts want to achieve reversion of the foregone TI. As soon as we can get there, 1617 is a good place to start. Absent significant consideration from the city or the RDA, I think the, it's safe to say the districts uh, certainly should oppose a major amendment by the RDA to increase the cap. Uh, the elementary district will be a basic aid district. The high school district will be almost a basic aid district, if not already one. Uh, if the uh, agency wants, if the RDA wants to do a major amendment, increase the cap to allow the RDA machine to keep rolling, that would be a real issue for the schools without some major consideration back. So then the question is, how can the two school districts and the city and the RDA work together to achieve their objectives? Ooh, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. We're interested in discussing those answers with you. Um, well, I would so suggest uh, that perhaps staff in the school decisions. district, because there's no way we're going to answer this right now. Oh, that right. was a... That was a lot to digest, and um, certainly if that's something we want to look into further, we can, between the staff and our staff, we can, we can work that out. But we just had a very detailed com uh, conversation about the RDA and the future of it this past Tuesday, which I think is also worth looking at as, as uh, yes, well. Yes, and, and one so. of the things that I presented here, I think, contradicts an item, a statement that was made there that okay. the schools well, we can are only losing that. one to two million a year. That I just want to acknowledge the other members of the agenda. I know there's still yeah. some public okay. speakers on something else. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Questions from Ms. Parker. Well, I don't really have a question at this point, although I, I would really like to hear about how other um, districts and cities uh, or counties, how other RDAs have worked together um, 
because the RDA has done so many terrific things, not least of which has been in the low and moderate income housing, which has brought students into our district. But I don't think that the RDA has ever actually worked with the district uh, ultimately on anything that's... Neither uh, of the districts has received any pass-through payments okay. from the RDA. Um, I'll state the obvious, which is, you know, $79 million over the next six or seven years would buy a lot of school crossing guards. Um, but seriously, I do think that the RDA has done a lot of terrific things. Um, but I think that it's, it can, there can be a tendency on the community's part to forget that there is an impact on the agencies that are not getting that money anymore. And when the state comes in, and sometimes I hear people say, the state's coming after our local RDA money. But the reason they're coming in is because that local RDA has already gone after the education money from their local district that the state is required by law to backfill. Okay, well, I, th so, I think there's some arguments about all sides of that, but, um, but I, I appreciate the comments. Mr. Williams and, and Mr. House. I think Mr. House is about to do his talking point, which is to talk about how well, maybe property values wouldn't have raised without the, the project. But... But I, when we had a discussion at the at the council uh, on this, um, I for one said that I that though I do support uh, ways to try to extend or um, do a new RDA, that I would only do so uh, under the conditions that would keep the the funding for schools whole under the scenario of of of. Uh, what do you call it? Rescission, revision, uh, reversion, reversion, um, because those those you know, and I, I also think that that makes it more realistically politically in Sacramento because obviously uh, schools are hurting and and need the money, and so uh, you know, to me, uh, the most important thing would be to try to figure out a way that we can either extend this pro this project for say housing purposes. Um, but um, uh, with with the schools receiving their share of the funds, that would happen under uh, the scenario of reversion. Uh, certainly, this is a very big discussion, and I appreciate uh, you're bringing it up here so we can talk about it, but we need to find the right venue to really work this out. Um, there are um, uh, very significant, um, maybe not Maybe not adversarial points of view, but they all, all the cards need to be on the table before we have this kind of conversation and have it in a sincere and genuine way. Certainly the redevelopment agency, um, those funds that we're talking about wouldn't have existed at that level. That is the tax increment after all. That is the improvement in the property value. That is the actual benefit to the community of the redevelopment agency there and for which we, it's not just aesthetic. This is a genuine improvement of the community. and. Um, and, 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 that's, and it's not necessarily, like, going to go on forever. You know, we really need to continue to work together to make sure we continue to have that kind of an improvement so we all can benefit. Um, and certainly in your equation of making decisions about basic aid versus revenue limit, uh, may, this must have been part of the, 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 the thought process because um, losing the backfill from the state was really, you know, a significant, would be a significant loss as you move forward into, into basic aid. Uh, given that there is a redevelopment agency. And a last little point here, I, I, some of this stuff gets really nutty. I mean, I, I've had people really argue against the redevelopment agency's investment in affordable housing because somehow that has put poor people into our community and then they've become a, a drag on our property tax revenue that's supposed to support the, the schools. And that's the kind of conversation I hope we can avoid and find out a way to really deal with this in a responsible way. So I'm really going to look forward to our staffs working together, giving us a chance to hammer this out, but do it in a, um, in a responsible and thoughtful way. And for the public who saw this presentation, I hope you also had a chance to see the one at the City Council the other day, so at least you'd have a couple of more pieces of the puzzle to, to, to think about. Thank you. Any other up here? Dr. Noel? Uh, I think we need uh, a lot of public education on this. Uh, I don't know anybody in the, in the school business, perhaps uh, with the exception of two or three people, who really understands what we just learned, uh, and uh, and certainly not uh, people at the grassroots in, the, in in public education, and certainly not the parents. Uh, so I I would like to to see something like a uh, joint workshops uh, where we would be able to talk about the trade-offs, get to understand the the complementary and the contending values, 
uh, and get and develop some community understanding, ultimately, so we can get some expressions of community concern and uh, and preferences. I appreciate that very much, and I apologize for rushing things along. Just wanted, and it just goes to show how much we're all there's so much mutual interest, and in, and we need more time on on agendas. So perhaps after we all get through this year's budget cycle, we can talk about how to have a more substantive discussion. Um, Ms. Smith, you have a public speaker slip. I'm going to give you one minute for this. Ahead. The funding model lacks equity. It treats similar districts differently, and the differences don't reflect the needs of our children or community. There are bad incentives, and schools that succeed with difficult children get less money. Okay. Um, there has never been accountability for the illegal, unethical, and uncivil, even immoral programs, policies, and practices of the education, political, industrial complex. And Doss Williams has stated that he knows there are problems, but there's nothing he can do. That is not true. With all due respect, I think we have just connected, uh, we have encountered the big stinky elephant in the room. There's no acknowledgement by you of the problems. There is no discussion of educational philosophy, curriculum, methodology, or assessment, which has not changed in the last 200 years. I request that you put some of the more knowledgeable public authorities into your discussion. You talk money because that's all you're concerned about. The movie Waiting for Superman uh, won Best Documentary at the Santa Barbara, at the Sundance Film Festival. And I could give you a presentation, if you would give me the time, about how we got here. Suffice it to say, it's only a matter of time before there is no more basic aid. There is coming an overhaul of the school funding model. It was, has created a cottage industry of Thank consultants you. who are paid. Uh, it was started in 1972, Serrano and Priest, and really, you are guilty of suppressing the truth. Truth comes as a conqueror, okay. only to those who have lost the art of welcoming it as a friend. Thank you. That closes public comment on this. We're going to move on to item number 13. Thank you. An update on the South Coast Gang Task Force activity. Mr. Lopez. Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, members of the Board of Education, I'm Marcelo Lopez. I'm the Assistant City Administrator. My goal today is to give you a brief update on the efforts of the South Coast Gang Task Force, and I will assure you that I have more than cut my presentation in half. I'm not going to repeat the presentations you have received in the past. Uh, you're fully aware of some of the efforts that we have undertaken. Instead, what I plan to quickly cover is uh, key milestones, accomplishments, where we are today, and close what we hope to accomplish this coming year. To put it in context, beginning in 2008, after a great deal of community input and participation, the South Coast Gang uh, Task Force was created, and a plan was adopted to move forward. Since, uh, uh, since, uh, since 2008, a lot of things have happened. The city assigned an interim coordinator, that was Don Olson. Uh, Don took us to the next phase of the effort, and although Don retired earlier this year, we are moving to the next phase of the process. But let me take you uh, quickly in terms of outcomes. In 2008, we launched a summer program of, based on client-specific assessment, based on client-specific plans. We established the caseworker model where we centralize the Santa Barbara County Office of Education, who work with 82 different youth involving youth gangs. The program was repeated in 2009. Case workers met individually with clients and their families to, to identify their specific needs, their barriers and interests, and in turn, what the case workers prepared were corresponding client-specific plans. These were specific plans to satisfy the specific needs of each of the youth. Case worker partners included the County Office of Education, the Santa Barbara School Districts, Community Action Commission, the Council on Drug and Alcoholism, and All for One. In 2009, we also secured the Cal, Gir Cal Grip Grant. This is a two-year program, $400,000 from the state, uh, with a $400,000 matching requirement from the city. 
And this uh, allowed us to continue the caseworker approach and client-specific case management, again, with a focus on the youth that are involved in youth gangs. Uh, today, we are pleased that as a result of these efforts, we have uh, a lot of things that we can be proud of. We establish a lot of partnerships, a very, very significant accomplishment. We work with All for One, a grassroots organization working with at-risk youth and gang members. We have been working very closely with the folks at El Puente Community School. Los Compadres and Las Comadres, two programs that you have heard about in the past that work with youth up to 12, uh, 12 years old and older. We have worked with the Collaborative Communities Foundation, a nonprofit organization designed to end youth uh, violence. We have also worked with Fighting Back and the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Uh, we have worked with the Youth Service Specialist, Teen Court. Employment and training linkages have been established in coordination with the Santa Barbara City uh, Just Program, as well as the county's Workforce Investment Board Summer Program. And lastly, uh, very, two last uh, very important accomplishments. We work very closely with the Santa Barbara County Probation Department, where we have been able to establish protocols to be able to jointly work with those youth that have uh, gang turn conditions. And then lastly, is that we have worked with the Santa Barbara School Districts. You have played a significant role in assigning a caseworker to work with at-risk youth. That is a model that we hope will be replicated throughout the school system. And in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Sarvis and I will be meeting with the superintendent from the District of Carpinteria to talk about uh, the prospects and opportunities. Uh, I'm getting close to my conclusion. Uh, most recently, in, in December of 2009, the leadership and executive councils agreed with the work of the committee and urge us to move forward. There are certain key elements that the plan emphasizes. We need to focus on the target population, which is the gang members and at-risk youth. We need to have comprehensive programs. We need to advocate for more coordination and partnerships. We need to institutionalize the effort in order to shift from being reactive to being more proactive. And this will require that, one, we find stable funding. Two, that we create a regional approach with a focus on the South Coast. Three, that we have partnerships with service providers, being that we are program rich but coordination poor. There are a lot of programs out there. By simply having better coordination, there could be better return on investment. We also have are placing full-time, uh, the, one of the efforts is also to find full-time staffing so that we can provide full-time attention to a problem that requires full-time attention. Uh, at this stage, uh, from January to April, we have now started the effort to procure funding. The mayor of, uh, of our city, Mayor Snyder, has uh, sent letters to the city of Goleta, the county of Santa Barbara, and the city of Carpinteria, asking them to join in an effort to fund uh, the effort. Uh, we have also, uh, yesterday when the city administrator presented his budget, he included uh, some funding for this program to be able to uh, allocate some funds to help hire a coordinator. We, ha we are in discussions with various foundations. Hopefully we can have foundations provide the effort. We will be making a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce in the near future to ask for their support. We are working with the Santa Barbara County Office of Education. They have agreed in concept to provide post-Cal Grip funding support to fund the case managers that are currently supporting the effort. Uh, the, uh, we are also establishing linkages and coordination with the various school districts. Lastly, the last two things that need to occur. Uh, we recently attended a meeting of the Community Action Commission. They have agreed to serve as the host agency, and the host agency means that organizational structure that is going to house and employ the coordinator on behalf of the task force. And lastly, if we can secure the funding, if we enter into the agreement with the Community Action Commission, then we'll be moving forward for the recruitment of a coordinator. That, in a nutshell, and very quickly said, is it's an update on the task force. That was a lot said in a short amount of time. Thank you very much. Any questions from the board or the council? We do. Yes, Dr. Noel. Uh, did I hear you correctly? or I, I have a hearing problem, but I thought I heard you say that you got something about $400,000 from CalGrip. 
That is correct. And that the city matched it with 400000 The city matched it with an in-kind contribution of various sources, principally okay. a lot of the uh, enforcement efforts through the police department, and then some of the other matching uh, dollars came by way of the other partnering, partnering and, and agencies. And how is that uh, money spent? How is that money spent? Yeah. It's principally hiring caseworkers to work with the clients, uh, funding some of the efforts similar to Las Compadre, Los Compadres and Las Comadres, which is that program that I uh, discussed in my presentation. It's also involving uh, some uh, prevention uh, efforts uh, through, the, uh, through CADA, and those are being coordinated through the school district. And those go to our sixth grade students okay. primarily. Yeah. And those are some of the key efforts. Uh, you also uh, mentioned the caseworker that the, as I, well, maybe I misunderstood, was it the Santa Barbara County Office of Education was supplying caseworkers? There are caseworkers coming from the Santa Barbara County Office of Education. Yeah. They are providing caseworkers. Also, the Santa Barbara School Districts, your school district, is providing a caseworker. Well, that one I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. And those are the ones that and, are and, and, and I'm asking these questions because there has been some concern. Uh, among um, my colleagues, that uh, that we would like to, that w we want to be sure that other agencies are matching our effort because I think we've been the pioneers in in uh, in providing funds, particularly for uh, this one project, which incidentally was systematically reviewed by a professor at the University of California and uh, reviewed very favorably, and we endorse that, uh, and I believe it's got foundation support from the Bauer Foundation, uh, and uh, we, th we, uh, we think very highly of that program and would certainly like to see that effort doubled or tripled uh, with help from outside. Thank you. Mr. Weldon, you had a question? I think all of us know the importance of making progress against gang violence, but the, I guess the questions that I had is, one is um, anecdotally, We've been told that this has reduced the recidivism rate among a typical group of 80 to 100 uh, young young people that are, are targeted each summer. Do we have any kind of good statistics on what that is, or is it more just anecdotal information? Um. Councilmember Williams, it's really not uh, anecdotal information, but it's pretty narrow information at this stage. I have to be very honest with you. We've had this program, the summer program, for a couple of years now, so we don't have a lot of experience under our belt. But what I can tell you, and specifically year one of this program, is that there were a number of students that were a number of youth with gang turns and conditions. And through our intervention, we were able to assure that 93% of them completed the, their gang terms and conditions, which meant that they, they didn't go right back into the system. They were able to accomplish an objective. We feel that that's in part as a result of the case management effort, working with the clients, giving them something to do uh, during the summer, and really providing that support. Often, all some of these uh, young people need is some support, some level of attention, some common sense, some guidance. And when you provide that through the case management process, you can gain those results. Now, as part of this process, we plan to create a better measurement system. And, and so there was 93% um, uh, completed in an 08? How, in 08. How many completed in 09, or do you have that? I don't have those uh, latest statistics. And about how many... Um, uh, uh, how many young people are, are assigned to each caseworker? I, I don't have the numbers. I'm, I'm more involved in the larger picture of putting the package together. Just if I knew how many caseworkers there were total, I, I, could, I could do the math. Do There's about five caseworkers that were involved okay. uh, during that period. Perhaps we can give that information afterwards. Um, questions from up here. We have two public comments. We have Carolyn Renard followed by Kate Smith. Madam, yes, uh, Madam right Mayor, ahead, Dr. I'd like to get in line for another comment. Why don't you go right ahead? Now? Sure. All right. Uh, the last time this, we met in this room about this issue, there was another dimension that was brought up, and that has to do with prevention, particularly with younger people. And, uh, and I know uh, uh, many of us have been referred to a report by the Surgeon General of the United States uh, on prevention of youth violence, uh, and I, I know I read most of it and it found it intriguing, particularly because in contrast to the caseworker approach, it talked about a public health approach, reducing the risk factors 
that uh, that young people encounter in their daily lives and in school and in community life. Has anything been done developing the, the preventive side, the prevention side of the house? I didn't hear any of that in your report. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Sarvis talk about that small piece within the CalGRIP grant. Well, that is a big thrust of the program at our schools, and I've been corrected. It's not just sixth grade students. It's fourth through sixth grade students, although in that approach, it's really a community-wide effort to to take on the sort of the ills of the community and provide a lot of support services, whether they're health services, whether they're jobs, um, a lot of family support is issues. And no, we have not gone that far. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Renard, be followed by Kate Smith. No, I'm sorry, but telling sixth grade students not to join gangs is really not going to fix this problem or prevent them from joining gangs. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an easy way to use up a fast $400,000 by trying to provide intensive services to individuals instead of adopting one of the U.S. Department of Ed programs that are known to work, have been in place in many states, such as the school-wide positive behavior programs. Instead, they've adopted U.S. Department of Justice programs and models um, and, and invented their own. Uh, and, they didn't even really use those models. They've invented their own that seems to be from about 20 years ago. I also wanted to point out that I went to a gang task force meeting a, a little over a year ago, and I tried to point out to the group the problem with the schools um, not giving us, uh, pushing, pushing out students with disabilities, and especially ADD and other mental health problems, and criminalizing them. And at that time, a Mr. Sarvis scornfully raised himself up and turned to me and said, we are completely in compliance. We've looked at this, and there are no problems. We're completely in compliance. He acted like he didn't know what I was talking about. And then the FICMAT report came out that, that the school board was forced to do later because of all the problems that, uh, that pointed out that they, uh, they are not in compliance. Basically, no one knows what they're doing in the special ed program. There is no program. Um, and the FICMAT report didn't even get into the real problems there. So um, it, they were not in compliance. So um, I don't see how Mr. Sorvis can have any credibility in your eyes at this point. Um, I also uh, wanted to say that Mr. Lopez did not, uh, you know, it's really just a tragedy that this subject is coming up at, you know, this time. There's no time to talk about it. Um, why you let this happen again on this agenda? It happens year after year, and I'm assuming that, Ms. Snyder, since you're in charge of this meeting, that this is your fault. Whoever allowed this to happen really should have something done about them. You know, this is really, this is inexcusable. Um, and it happens every year. I can't even believe it's happening again after this city has had four youth, su young Hispanic, low-income suicides, nine attempted suicides, and probably a bunch of other ones. Okay. You know, how can wind up, please be doing this? Thank you. Kate Smith will be our final speaker on this topic. And certainly I could have reviewed the agenda a little more carefully beforehand, so I, w I, I wish we all had more time on this. Go ahead, Kate. Mayor Schneider, members of everybody present, I request equal time to rebut Mr. Lopez's statements. All of the participants in his program receive CalGRIP grant monies, whereas the community activist groups, the advocates and parent groups have been ignored, dismissed, or vilified. And, of course, none of the organizations that truly work with the students receive any of the CalGRIP grant monies, uh, which, by the way, it was $800,000 approved two years ago because it's a two-year program, uh, whereas Brian Sarvis and Michael Gonzalez and Don Olson received tens of thousands of dollars into their own back pocket. Did you know that? In fact, when I gave a California uh, CPRA request to the city for the accounting of the CalGrit grant, all I received is that Don Olson was given 36000 himself to be the administrator. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, you do the request for the accounting. Don Olson called the Hispanics Vector. Do you know what Vector is? I don't have the time to tell you, but it's pretty disgusting. And the students who were uh, in the audience uh, were pretty upset simply because, uh, you know, how would you feel? But anyway, uh, they told me that they had been forced to sign up and register as gang members so that the gang task force could claim that they had more 
gang members and could ask for more money. The gang task force leadership council and executive uh, council are cabals. They are kept separate. There is no accounting for the over $5 million that they receive in funding from all the various entities. Kate, your time's up. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. Any other questions from Mr. Snyder, Sarvis? That's patently false. Excuse me? That's patently okay. false. Uh, well, Comments from... Go ahead. Any other questions from the Counselor of School Board? Okay, our last item... Um, update on the miracle marijuana dispensary ordinance. Just, you know, a little thing <laughs> that we're working on. I do, before we move forward, I did want to alert my colleagues on the city council. I did get a, I think we all got a, um, a memo from our uh, city attorney that because this item is currently under deliberations with our ordinance committee, that while we want to hear what people have to say and certainly hear from members of the school board and staff, uh, we should not today be deliberating on the ordinance itself uh, due to Brown Act issues. So it's on the agenda, but just to keep that in mind and with the time that we have anyway, that's probably a good thing to keep us quiet. So, um, But we will certainly take everything everyone has to say as we move forward with this item. It's on the ordinance committee next Tuesday, I believe. Is that right? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Madam Mayor, Paul Casey, Assistant City Administrator. I'll ask the preference of the council and board if you'd like a really quick presentation summary of what the ordinance is, or I could wrap it up and say, been working on a revised ordinance, a lot of public comment, over 15 meetings over the last nine months, tough issue, uh, heard a lot of input from all sides. There is a draft ordinance that tries to tighten up the operational restrictions and other things of medical marijuana. I can go into a little more detail or... Why don't we open it up comment. to questions first from the school board about if there's something specific, status, and then go to public comment on that. So, Mr. Herring, did you have something? Uh, just one and question. Then, what in there um, relates to the distance away from schools? The uh, ordinance, the proposed draft ordinance and the existing ordinance has 500 feet distance from schools, and it limits five citywide uh, in seven different geographical areas. Ms. Parker, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Dr. Noel? Uh, footnote on uh, Mr. Heron's question. What about safe routes to school, safe from exposure to Thank you. At, at, at this point, the uh, draft ordinance does not include any distance issues or things dealing with the safe routes to school issue. And just to clarify, I think the ordinance is now so detailed it's about actual storefronts as opposed to bigger areas, right, and, and different one per area. So... You could look at those particular items, and it's on the council agenda as well. Any other questions? Ms. Parker. Well, just that um, I, I would like to see um, a copy. I'm sure it's on your website, so I'll go look for it there, the, the latest version of it. I know that there have been many iterations along the way. Um, I do, as a school board member, have concerns about it, not even mentioning schools, um, just in terms of uh, in future years, people losing perspective on maybe why you set up zones where they are and, and, and so forth. So I, that is something that maybe our board will want to weigh in on after we take a look at, at one of our own meetings. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Hotchkiss and Mr. White. Uh, just a clarification. The reason it didn't mention schools was well, the other criteria it effectively put all uh, potential dispensaries outside of a 500-foot area. Might have been one or two feet off in one case, but that's why it didn't specifically mention schools. Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and, and I'd ask uh, those that uh, um, look at the draft ordinance to, uh, to inspect the, the changes of uh, the, the identity of dispensaries. That is to say, who can use it and the structure of how it operates is a key ingredient that's attempt, where the attempt is to tighten it up very substantially. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move it to public comment. We have uh, Denise Fellows. She's still here, followed by Shireen Catapush. Is Denise here? No, she, she had to go. She, uh, Shireen Catapush, followed by Mary Mender. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me time to speak. I know you're supposed to be wrapping up now. Um... I want to thank you. I know that you are public servants and public stewards, and you have difficult jobs, but you've chosen to be leaders in our community and to protect children in our community. I, too, am a public servant of sorts, and I think you all know that I work for the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. What City Council may not know is that when students um, 
get caught being high on campus or with pot in the backpack or pipe in the locker. They get sent to us at the council. So we're every day dealing with students and their families when alcohol and other drugs are a problem. Um, so I know you're here and in your positions because you care about our kids and our community. Me too. Um, and I'm glad to see that you're meeting together, and I'm here to ask you to work even more closely together in protecting our kids. At the council, what we support is a ban on pot shops. We don't think they're necessary or legal. Um, sick people who need marijuana can still get it without storefront pot shops. That's what we support. We also support a thousand foot barrier around schools and recovery facilities. Um, so I know you've heard that from me time and again, but I feel like it's my duty to come and say that to you and share our perspective since we're doing prevention and treatment with kids and families every day. Thank you for your efforts to protect our kids and our community. What you permit, you promote. Thank you. Mari Mender and the final speaker will be Nancy Harder. Is Nancy still here? Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Dr. Sarvis, and all the members of our school board and our city council. My name is Mary Mender. I am a parent in the city. I'm a nurse at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, and I do uh, drug and alcohol rehab and psychiatry and mental health nursing. I'm also a very concerned citizen because although I know there are people in this room who are ardent supporters of legalizing marijuana, I'm not delusional. I it may happen. Even though I don't share that value, I think it's a terrible idea. And in the big scheme of things, it shouldn't be at the forefront of what we care about today. There are so many other bigger problems that we should be talking about and not wasting time on. However, we are talking about it. It is in Santa Barbara. And there is no law in the land that says we must have storefront dispensaries, not one. But if you insist on having these in our city, and we believe, I believe that we have common ground and that we all do care about kids and the future of our youth. If you really believe that, then you will put a 1,000 foot buffer zone between schools, parks, youth centers, and drug and alcohol rehab centers. You have to realize how vulnerable and defenseless some of our citizens are. Children, the disenfranchised, the mentally ill, or high-risk populations. We need to protect them from themselves and from people who wish to harm them. So I'm asking you to please, and when you say that this ordinance has been tightened up on who can use them, then why on earth do you need five? Because it's a very few number of people who t really are that seriously ill that they require medical marijuana. It's not that many. So I thank you for your time, and I respect each and every one of you. You have a tough job, but thank you for caring about kids and working together this way. Thanks. Thank you. And final speaker is Nancy Harder. Good afternoon. Thank you for the, the chance to speak. It's more difficult to be on this side than it is on that side I'm finding right now. Um, my name's Nancy Harder. Um, uh, for those of you who I've not met before, I'm a former school board member at the Santa Barbara School Districts. Um, I served for eight years. And I've participated in easily hundreds of expulsion hearings. That's too bad Mrs. Cordero had to leave. Dr. Noel was with me through all of those, uh, Mrs. Parker. Um, and the majority of those hearings were for students who engaged in drug use on our campuses. I listened helplessly as crying parents begged school board members to do something about access to contraband in the community and on school campuses. Our school administrators work relentlessly to limit access uh, to contraband on campus, but we need partners to limit access in the community. And I'm here today to speak for those parents. The schools need you, the city council members, to partner with them to control the easy access to pot and to support students to graduate from high school and become successful members of our community. One of the foremost goals of the city council should be to nurture the health and safety of community members. Certainly the health and safety of seriously ill community members is given a high, a high priority uh, in the draft ordinance, as it should be. But in serving the patient's needs, the draft ordinance also places a high priority on the desires of dispensary entrepreneurs and recreational drug users. Uh, it doesn't strike enough of a balance when trying to, to, to serve the needs of some of our most vulnerable community members, our students. I'm here today to plead with you on behalf of those parents from so many expulsion hearings to place a high priority on the health and safety of children and families. I would ask that you severely limit the number and location of dispensaries, eliminate edible products, 
and provide for the 1,000-foot buffer zone around all schools. Um, and in referencing an earlier agenda item that you dealt with, to my mind, what I'm requesting is a metaphorical school crossing guard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Back, yes, Dr. Noel. Yes, I, I, I would just like to put a plug in for making Milpas Street really off bounds. I just go outside of Santa Barbara High School and watch the flow of traffic. The 500 feet passes very quickly. There are hundreds of kids uh, who are joined by still others leaving Santa Barbara Junior High. And they, they walk, starting at noon, uh, they go and they just keep going. And uh, a thousand feet wouldn't do the job. It would have, I think, I'm, I'm just going through my mind thinking about each school may have u unique circumstances. Certainly, Santa Barbara High and Santa Barbara Junior High present unique circumstances. I would hope your committee looks at each one in its own right. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I've closed public comment on this item. Are you handing this in? Yes, thank you. Because I talked about it, and, uh, I'd like you to make sure that everybody gets a copy because I'm submitting it according to what I said. Okay, I will, I will pass this around. Mr. Williams. Well, um, I um, have been advised from our, our city attorney not to deliberate. I'll try to stay away from any specifics of the ordinance, but just try to say some big picture things. Um, you know, one one of them is first of all, you know, as a as someone that still teaches college classes and has um, been a, a junior high school teacher, I um, no priority is more important to me than our kids. Um, but the idea that we, as the city, um, promote what we permit is a fallacy. Um, I, if I had my druthers, we wouldn't have a liquor store in this whole town, right? Uh, you know, if I could just do what I want, we wouldn't have a liquor store in town. You know, uh, you'd go, I guess people who wanted it would go to the grocery store, but uh, I think Liquor stores are often predatory on poor communities and don't promote the right things. And I know as a young person, that's one of the places I used to, you know, get my beer or whatever. But um, we have to work within the law. And the irony of having paraded in front of us a resolution from the Assembly, the very body that passed Senate Bill 420 that gave us this enormously vague and difficult to implement law is should not be lost on anybody here right we are the local but government trying to implement a law that is just very unclear um, allows any collective to operate in it without a location right so if we ban storefronts means they can just go next door to you and I think that nothing is more dangerous for our kids than a collective without a location that we can't regulate, meaning stuff happening in people's neighborhoods that we cannot uh, oversee the same way that we can a storefront collective. And so I would offer that as uh, that I am diametrically um, opposed to the idea that bringing it out of sight solves the problem. In fact, I would argue that it makes makes it more dangerous and more accessible for our kids, and I don't think that's a solution to this. Um, so we're struggling to comply with the law but still provide accountability, and I, I, I really give kudos to the Ordinance Committee to, re to uh, re wrestle with this. Um, uh, it was very difficult to wrestle with it last year, and the amount of time that you guys are putting in really uh, should be uh, commended. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Williams is right about one thing, and that is that the state law in this area is vague, and that is one of the problems we're wrestling with. Uh, many, many cities in this state have uh, taken the expeditious route of simply banning uh, marijuana dispensaries, period. Uh, there is no zoning for these things. Uh, whether it was the right decision for Santa Barbara to go ahead and try and regulate these things, I don't know, but that's what we're in the middle of now and that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, I am unfortunately not optimistic about our ability to control these operations 
whether they're in storefronts or somewhere else, uh, as long as we are the only jurisdiction within 300 miles in any direction that is making this available as, unfortunately, an entrepreneurial opportunity. Uh, the pressure for criminal activity here is just enormous. Uh, so the Ordinance Committee has a very, very difficult job in front of it. Uh, what I hope we can do is come up with a definition, which, which, as Mr. Williams points out, the state has failed to do, come up with a definition of what kind of organization it would be that would be a truly compassionate organization that would supply this to the small number of people who actually need it rather than to the thousands and thousands of people who are getting it right now, most of them for recreational purposes. Thank you. Anyone else up here? Thank you. And I do appreciate the comments over many months by the board and staff of the school district It's moving this forward. Okay, last item in terms of additional matters for placement. I do have one um, public comment request from Carolyn Renard, if you'd like to do that. And then we'll wrap up. Thank you. I hope you will address these issues generally at the next meeting. Um, one is uh, some cases that Joan Esposito, there are several cases in Joan Esposito's office that have just come in, a case where a nine-year-old student had the police called on him by the schools. He was having behavior problems after a principal grabbed him and held him upside down after this, the, the parent was reported to CPS and not the principal. Uh, the mother of another child who uh, asked over and over again for help for her daughter who was having emotional problems and academic problems. She requested an assess that her child be assessed. The schools are, by federal law, required to assess them if a parent requests an assessment. Her assessment was ignored. Uh, some months after that, the child attempted suicide. Uh, even after that, she, didn't, she wasn't getting counseling. Um, she had nothing until Joan Esposito parent contacted her and she's stepped in and now some things are starting to happen. This is happening over and over in our schools and Joan's office is swamped with these and I hope that at the next meeting this council, and before that certainly, but you know, this council really starts addressing this problem. Um, I, I also um, wanted to, oh, there was, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it was. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items you want to give to staff as we look to the next agenda? Ms. Parker. Well, I certainly hope that staff will be having a discussion before we meet again on, on uh, a number of issues. Um, one of the things that we weren't able to talk to uh, uh, talk about today was the issue of the school resource officer at Santa Barbara High School, um, which has been lacking um, over the past year. Um, and. I hope that that will be something that's resolved before we meet again, but uh, one way or another, I'd like to have uh, information about that. Um, and another area that I would really like to see us collaborate on is graffiti education. The board is um, re revamping its policy about um, graffiti and vandalism, and we're hoping to include an education piece. Um, and I know that the city has, you know, Looking Good Santa Barbara and, and um, programs in place, and I think it would be great for us to coordinate. Great. Perhaps the school resource officer issues could be brought up during the police department budget this year, which is in a couple of weeks, since that's where it is. Uh, Mr. Williams. You know, I, it's probably not appropriate for the city to be asking for um, review of specific cases, as was requested by a member of the public just now. But what would, uh, what would be useful is at least to have a presentation on the um, F FICMAT report um, so that we could understand that because it comes up a lot at, this, at, these, at these meetings and we definitely get a lot of um, email about it. I, I have read the preliminary report, not the full report, um, but it would be great if uh, at the next meeting um, we had a, a, a presentation of that report and, and what the school district is sort of uh, doing on that subject matter. It would be, be great and useful for our purposes. Not an agenda item, but I want to take the opportunity to end on a high note. Is um, I want to thank the staff and, uh, and all of our staff, and, but especially Peabody School and uh, Santa Barbara Community. They were named Distinguished Schools just recently. Mm -hmm. And I know, Mr. Williams, that's uh, 
uh, something you're happy about, but we have two great schools. We have a lot of great schools, but these two specifically got tremendous honors, and our staff needs to be recognized and thanked, and we appreciate it very much. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll take that to the uh, whole Peabody board and parents. Thank there you. There you go. We're all happy about that, not just Mr. Williams. Okay. Anything else from... I would suggest we have a three-hour time limit, not a two-and-a-half. That might help a little bit in terms of our um, agenda timing. Great. Thank you very much. There's obviously a lot here that a lot of mutual interest concerns. I appreciate the time available that we have. This meeting's adjourned.